always cover May, June, July, August. Um, and starting in May, May 1st, here's a movie that I have a little something to say about because I rewatched it probably in the past couple of years. It's a, it's it's a staple on channels like Encore at two o'clock in the morning. Burt Reynolds in Malone. <laughs> that was, that came, oh, that's right. That did come out in theaters. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that was it did. Back when Burt was still getting work, even though he wasn't doing good work. So true, true. I don't know. It's one of those. Uh, I, it's one of those movies that. I mean, that's exactly what it's for. Two a.m. on Encore. It, it's the kind of delicious, you know, absurd. Uh, he the the story of the guy, the loner that enters the small town and and he stays around to, to stand up against the corporation tyrant. And in this case, it was played by C- Cliff Robertson and uh, Lauren oh, Hutton was Lauren Hutton and Cynthia Gibb were in it. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, oh God, I do. Remember I prefer that. I prefer Stick, but yeah, Malone. Yeah, I, I do was... too. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, not not great by any means, but I, I watch it for Burt Reynolds and how he tries to do the Steve McQueen thing, where he he shows he shows as uh, he reads as little dialogue as possible. He tries to sh- to show a, as little emotion as possible. I mean, he is he is uh, stiffer and deader than his hair in this movie. <laughs> it, <laughs> but he's he's interesting to watch. I mean, he holds a screen to a certain a certain extent. And, and he was only two years away from Cop and a Half, right? Yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. Well, no, longer, no, longer six, than that. Six years away. He was, uh, he was two years away from his comeback, which was Breaking In. Uh, that was his ah. Breaking In. Uh, I mean, he, he'd had success with that kind of stoicism, taciturn stoicism, yes. with like Sharky's Machine, which is very, very good. But then mm-hmm. it kind of became his de facto serious mode. Uh, Rent-A-Cop is a... Uh, Rent-A-Cop. It's a little bit more oh. just because of just because of Bert and Liza Jesus. Minnelli. Thank you. What is? This? Are we trying to kill the show immediately? I mean, Rent the cop, Rent the cop, Rent the cop, cop and a half. Uh, he, if it had cop in the title, it was in, except for cop. Oddly enough, Bert Reynolds was not in cop. He should have been in cop, but he was in Rent a cop. Uh, wow. Yeah. Bert Reynolds in RoboCop, but man. <laughs> he wouldn't have needed, uh, he wouldn't have needed the armor. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I I always had a soft spot for Burt Reynolds, and I mean, it, but it, it goes back to he has a problem that a couple of actors I can think of have in that he's been given so many, stumbled upon so many comebacks in his career. Really, I mean, multiple mm-hmm. comebacks, mm-hmm. and then he and then he always manages to squander them. And I don't know if that's the choice of roles that he's given post comeback, or just he wants to work. He's hungry to work, so he does anything. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like, God, there's a critic friend of mine, Walter Chaw, who calls Sean Connery the Scottish Burt Reynolds, and I mean, he means it as a, like a real dig. <laughs> yeah, I would say, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and I mean, I'm just thinking about it, though, you know, like, I remember um, a friend, a uh, colleague of mine and I interviewed Malcolm McDowell once, and, you know, Malcolm McDowell, I think, too, just takes practically anything. But yeah. the way he the way he talked about it in the interview was like you know I'm a he said I'm a working actor I'm trying to do my best not for McDowell but <laughs> uh, and 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 he and he meant it in the sense that he likes to work you know and he will take roles that kind of go all over the spectrum and sometimes there are really fallow periods and everything I mean he looks at it like mainly as a job I think um, yeah and uh, and, and you know I, I mean. He, I, I, I'm not as familiar. I don't feel as much of a familiarity with the Burt Reynolds filmography, and I don't know like what his financial situation is, is or anything. I mean, at, at a certain point, I think it just though know, for some people becomes either a job or a habit or something. You know, it's, it's a habitual thing, and right. you know, you, and he wants to work. And then you have someone on the other side of the spectrum, like Daniel Day Lewis, who just like goes off for, into a cabin for a few years and, like, does pottery or poetry or whatever mm-hmm. he was doing and then, you know, come back when he feels like it. Um, well, and, I, 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 actually, I actually make that – and it's not – I actually do make that criticism because I do really like Burt Reynolds. I always have. Uh, he does have and, talent. It's true. And, and I think that um, he doesn't have the talent of a Gene Hackman who was a working actor as well, and he did – a lot of movies mm-hmm. uh, and and a lot of mediocre to bad movies, but he was always distinctive and kind of a comforting presence in them. I mean, 
Uh, Gene I, Hackman's I, last movie is Welcome to Fucking Mooseport. Yes. yes. He needs to come back and, and, and do Wait, one more the, thing. Was the fucking in the title? Not in the theater. I saw yeah. it. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, well, I think part of that, I think part of that, Jamie, is, is also just has to do with uh, luck. I mean, yes, Gene Hackman also made a, you know, he, you can find a period where he's making, you know, bad movies. Right. I mean, I mean summer '87, he's doing Superman four, and right. you know, but I think <laughs> <it's a matter. laughs> oh, okay, no, we'll get to that. He's doing Superman four, and and Michael Caine. I mean, let's try it yeah, this Michael way. Caine, yeah. Michael oh, yeah. Caine. Oh, is yeah. doing Jaws, 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 Jaws the Revenge. Jaws the Revenge. So. Of these three working actors who did work for the sake of it, I would say Burt Reynolds probably had the the better of the three films. With the if you want to go with Malone, Renner, you know Malone, he Jaws might, Four, he might and, do that. <laughs> you know Jaws yeah. Four and uh, and uh, what you know uh, Superman Four. Right. I'm gonna go with Malone. I would wow. too, but what right? I'm saying yeah, about I mean... what I'm saying about Burt Reynolds is that I would have actually liked to have seen him capitalize. Yeah. On the good fortunes that he he got in terms of the occasional great role, because, mm-hmm. uh, right. because yeah. I, I like him. I mean, I I I didn't want yeah. it to be as rare as a Bigfoot sighting to see a good Burt Reynolds movie. Well, I mean, you know? he, had, he is funny on Archer. Yeah, no, funny. I mean he is on that, but I mean he was for a while there. I mean in his heyday, the seventies and and up into the early eighties. I mean I think it's really the first Cannonball Run is where things sort of take a downward spiral. If well, I'm not critically, mistaken. but the thing is, Burt Reynolds, I mean, people people cannot fathom this, or may have a hard time wrapping their head. I think it was, I can't remember, it was either four or five years five in years. a row. Five years. Yeah. Five years in a row. He was the number one box office. We right. never had, that has never been duplicated. Yeah. Uh, I, I, don't I, I mean, yeah. I mean, some of this, too, I think, can be chalked up to where movies were at the time, and you know, in in terms of like what system he was working in. I mean, you know, the system goes over goes under an overhaul. Like, yeah, you know, th- I don't think the superhero vogue that's happening now is going to last forever. I think that's just it's just been proven that these things seem, tend to move in like ten to fifteen or maybe twenty year cycles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? right. Uh, I mean, I, I, and you know, I just think that's inevitable, and and I don't know, you know, necessarily what the next big thing will be. But it's like you know, now we're in a period where I guess you could say, and and I don't mean it entirely derogatorily, but like the geeks have won, uh, or or are running the asylum right now. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, but but I think you know, with every rise, then there's going to be a fall afterwards. So it's like, I, and, mm-hmm. and and then, but then you have actors who go through all these different periods, and you know, so you have like seventies Burt Reynolds, and he can be in like Deliverance, and uh, you know, do some even even in a terrible movie like the Bogdanovich. Uh, at long last love, you know that's an interesting project, you know, in terms of what it's trying to do. Um, and then you get into the '80s, and it's kind of like, you know, the system that gave rise to the '70s Hollywood is like you know, all but destroyed, and and now it's like he's in these, you know, it's <laughs> really crappy comedies and right. and, uh, and and high concept comedies. And now, now is he like, what is he doing now? It's like. Direct to video yeah. stuff and and just like infomercials. I don't even know. Did he do infomercials? No, well he's I, he is a he's kind of had he now has this kind of cult status, and so I think I mean uh, I don't know if any of anyone other than me here has seen Archer, and so he's very you know so they use him for Archer and mm-hmm. uh, he's quite they they use that kind of Burt Reynolds vocal delivery uh, for great uh, comic effect. Right. But, you know, so there you so, go. So I mean, so, so now he's gotten. I, I mean. Again, I, I don't know. I don't quite know how he makes his choices. You know, it's like, I think, he, I think he's. I think he's riding the nostalgia wave in his career too, because we're coming Probably. up on an, anniversaries of his of his most beloved movies. I mean, he's been riding the riding the roads about Smokey and the Bandit and Deliverance for a couple of years now. Mm-hmm. God, there's going to uh, be a Smokey and the Bandit reboot, isn't there? You know, well, you know what? Uh, it was funny because Turner Classic Movies did, and then I'll move on to the next show, but this is, uh, next movie, but Turner. Yeah. Classic Classic Movies does their annual road show where they mm-hmm. they go to different big cities and they show an American in Paris or they show Singing in the Rain and Debbie Reynolds will be there and blah, blah, blah. Our mm-hmm. area here in Florida, we got Smokey and the Bandit and Burt Reynolds. Uh, <laughs> so it wasn't yeah. like a Singing that, in the Rain. But that first one is – I do like the first one. It's I mean, awesome. It, it is a revelation to go see that in the first grade. 
And, I mean, they're swearing and cussing and everything. And I was just like, mm. oh, this is great. I love this. This is awesome. <laughs> this feels yeah. like home to me. <laughs> it is like home. Like, <laughs> like, the, like the principal, which is why yeah. I must love yeah. James Belushi so much. <laughs> uh, also on May 1st, Creep Show 2. Oh, dear. Uh, I only now, Aaron. You have a better recollection of this movie than I do because I think you've seen it more recently. But I only remember the oil slick uh, scene in the in the right. lake. That's the one that everyone because it's just kind of it's kind of this identikit uh, creep show kind of episode, you right. know, creep show story of you know, you know, four little Indians being picked off by a monster kind of thing. It's mm-hmm. kind of disposable, but I mean, yes, it's on Netflix. I did watch it, but. Uh, Eric Henderson was right that the last episode, the uh, Thanks for the Ride Lady, oh, yeah. is the one that does have some of that EC Comics wit to it. I mean, mm-hmm. and of course, I mean the thing is, uh, the 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 sequel doesn't hold a candle to the Romero one. Oh yeah. But, but uh, so Romero you know, I, wrote this, right? No, no, no. Just Stephen King. Stephen King wrote Romero had nothing to do with this. Yeah. It was based oh, on Stephen okay. King. Stephen King stories and. Uh, and, well, and I always maintain Creepshow is the best thing Romero ever directed. Uh, uh, but and, and also one of the very first true, you know, before uh, Watchmen or any of these other, or Sin City, it was a true, you know, comic book, graphic novel looking mm-hmm. uh, movie. And so, but yeah, Creepshow 2, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. It's that late 80s kind of disposable horror. There's good disposable horror, like, you know, Wes Craven's Shocker. And then there's bad disposable horror like Creepshow Two. So, mm. It's just yeah, I remember. It is, yeah, it's just nope. not a good movie. No, it's not. We watched it. On, I watched it on a front. We watched it at a friend's house like a year later on videotape. Mm. And I'm mean, more laughing than anything else about how cheesy it was, especially the like you know the the, the thing. It was, a, oil it, was a, it was a straight to video movie before there were straight to video movies. That's true. Very true, yeah. Aaron. That's what. That's what. It, I mean, it's kind of you know. There are some movies you know now, obviously, that make it to that go to video or VOD, and you're like, why didn't they release this in the movie? This could have been a little art house indie hit, you I, know. But th- then there are movies back then that, like, why did this get to theater? Why did Why did Black Moon Rising get released on a thousand screens? You know, why did Creep Show Two get released? Why? Well, you know? I, 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 have, I have point. I have to. I have to interject though here. I'm I'm pulling up IMDb on my uh, on my on my computer here uh, for Creepshow 2, and I am seeing that Romero is credited with the screenplay. Oh, okay. Well, then I am. Uh, I'm. I, is it? That's, I guess is it Stephen it, King short stories that he's adapting? Stephen King short stories that Romero hmm. adapted into a screenplay. So maybe that's part of the reason that got something of a release. His, I you guess know, those so. two and, names. And is that's the, the thing. The Star Indian. The Indian. Cigar store Indian in the first story. I, or, I don't. Yeah. Even, I don't. Even, and I, I guess that's the thing. I guess uh, you know because I mean let's be honest. Romero is a little long winded when he writes his own material and doesn't have a collaborator. Uh, mm-hmm. So maybe the fact that he didn't work with King on this, like on the first creep show, it probably explains it's kind of a uh, you know mm. the a well, the, quest, the, the question is. I mean, they both came out the same day. Which one was scarier, Creep Show Two or Malone? Um, I'm gonna go with Malone. I'm gonna I go with Malone. I mean, <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the following week, uh, we talked to DB Sweeney. I remember about this movie. Actually, I, I, see, I was gonna plan like a whole bunch of clips that I was gonna play of previous interviews that we've done because we've talked to a lot of participants of some of the movies out this summer and years previous, but um, I didn't get a chance to. Gardens of Stone, which is Francis Ford Coppola's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, post post uh, Vietnam film, um, <clears throat> and uh, it, a very emotional shoot for Francis Coppola, right? Because his mm. his son was killed in, in the middle of the shoot, and it kind of it changed the chemistry of that of the experience of making that movie certainly, and I'm sure it changed the movie as well in a certain way. But um, yeah. what do we recall this at all? Between the well, you know, I watched it relatively recently. Uh, for, I mean, a few months ago, but because uh, I was sort of going through a Coppola thing, I think he's he's one of my favorites of the of the movie brats, uh, mm-hmm. movie brat mm-hmm. generation. And I think he's gotten to a place now where he's he's been doing very interesting work um, with Youth Without Youth and Tetra. And I'm eager to see Twix, even though it was kind of torn apart at uh, Toronto by the critics. I still feel like he's 
done some really interesting experiments and uh, and 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 gotten some really great movies out of it. Um, you know, in the at this point in the '80s when he was doing you know Gardens of Stone, it was uh, I think kind of a, a the fallow period for him and everything. And yet there are there are really good things uh, that that he that he does. I mean, this came right after Peggy Sue got married, which mm-hmm. I think was you know as I recall a pretty big hit. And, Oscar uh, nominated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, and, and Gardens of Stone, you know, it's. It, I, I, I guess I guess what I'd say about it is that it's uh, it's, it's a knowingly uh, small movie, and uh, it, and it doesn't aim for like you know the the grandiosity of like the '70s Coppola and stuff. Mm-hmm. I think he was kind of went, winding his way back into kind of more personal stories here, right. uh, and. Uh, and and I mean I, I can't say that you know I, I found anything that was like iconic in it or anything, but it was it was it was a very it, it was sort of like a very well like a very well done indie nowadays, albeit directed kind of by like a master. And clearly you could see that mastery in there. Um, it's just like it, it's one of those things where you have someone who's a great filmmaker, but um, he doesn't quite have the resources or the spirit or something, you know, uh and and you can sort of sense that and yet you can still see some really, you know, yeah. so, some good stuff happening <laughs> right. in front of you. It's just like I I don't I feel I feel like I, I I don't I don't quite know when I feel like he got it he got it back. I mean, he uh I mean, I love the 92 Dracula and everything, <laughs> but I really feel like when he when he finally you know, just said, you know what? I'm going to finance my own movies and shoot them on, in high def with this Romanian cinematographer, and and, and then he just, he, he, I feel like he took off into a whole other place yeah. there. And I and we, always, about we that always wanted. I mean, he had a special gift. Even the the the, the epic films uh, that he's most acclaimed for, the Godfathers and Apocalypse Now. I mean, yeah. he. He ca- he tapped into the very personal expression in epic form in those, mm-hmm. but yeah. I I always adored. I mean, one of my all time favorites is the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I always yearned oh, yeah. for for a time when Coppola would return to that kind of intimate uh, personal level of filmmaking. And by all accounts, he has. I mean, the <laughs> the the, yeah. the movies uh, might not be up to par for me with the conversation, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm excited that that he feels kind of. Rejuvenated and reborn, and he feels like a student of film again. I mean, there's, there's, there's yeah. the quality to him now that I, I find very infectious. And, mm-hmm. and there's yeah, a level of craft, yeah. there's a level of craftsmanship even in these kind of small films. There is because yeah, that's because the you know that maybe another you know less established director might not have that confidence. I mean, I could recently rewatch The Rainmaker, and of course, I mean The Rainmaker is there's nothing groundbreaking about The Rainmaker. It's a John Grisham potboiler, but I mean, after the Gingerbread Man, I think it's the best John Grisham mm. movie, if you will, because yeah, there's such it's so well cast and mm-hmm. and Coppola, man, you know, he he modulates the pacing of the performances and of the story that even though you know exactly where it's going, and you, and you, you can feel the great love of actors and of just of mm-hmm. of of characters and being in the middle of the story of yeah. the story telling a story. Yeah. You you feel that yeah. love in that in that movie in a very special way too. And, and I'm just looking over his filmography here, and you know it seems like from like Apocalypse Now to probably including the Cotton Club, he was kind of, he, and, and and that is sort of you know a downturn sort of in his fortunes, if not necessarily in his creativity. Mm-hmm. That whole arc, you know, because then he gets into One from the Heart, which basically bankrupts him. But then he has The Outsiders and Rumblefish, which are both very interesting and experimental and the cotton club is too albeit i think that finally just puts the nail on the coffin sort of and then he has to go hollywood because then he has like captain eo which i saw so many damn times when i went to the <laughs> epcot center I, re- I remember captain eo so vividly and you know peggy sue is like a crowd pleaser in gardens of stone and tucker the man in his dream and then of course he returns to the well with the Godfather three and everything, which I defend, but which I know is is a very flawed movie. I'm with you. I'm with you there. But I, I, I like Tucker too. Tucker too. I thought Tucker was actually because I knew nothing Tucker's about him, and I thought it was very good. I mean, I yeah, it was no, Tucker is really good, and uh, you know, I mean, someday I'll get to Jack, but you know, <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have. I know. To. Yeah, you can hold off on that. <laughs> everybody well, has everybody has one. There's always that's one. That's right. I will right. say it, it's inter- Jack. Is, I will say that Jack is interesting for 
for believe it or not, for a good Bill Cosby performance and a very good Bill Cosby performance. Yes, believe it. He was in the movie. God, I really don't remember this at all. Yeah, he was. He's in the movie. Hey, Bill Cosby. I think it was an inspired casting choice, actually, Bill Cosby in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Don't knock Bill Cosby, man. Oh, I wouldn't knock Bill Cosby. I just don't remember. I don't remember the movie that well, Aaron. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm telling Keith. Don't knock Bill Cosby, man. Armand White will get mad. uh, (laughs) No, we don't want that. I don't want that. Yeah. God forbid that. No, but I think it's good that Coppola's making movies. As long as I want him making movies. If all these other guys are making movies, I want Coppola making movies. We went too long without him making anything, so Yeah. I I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with at le at the very least use it uh, use in twi- uh, in Tetra, you know, at some point because I think those are I, I, I would put those next to his his, uh, his most iconic work mm-hmm. in, in in a lot of ways. I'm I like really that, I'm really yeah. inspired by I'm really inspired by both those films. Use it out, use especially, and I hope I can. That, that's that's for down the road. But anyway, yeah. I mean, you know, like you know, Gardens of Stone is sort of like um, I guess Coppola, you know, at sea a little bit, and yet at the same time, you can still see the mastery that made him. I think probably one of the greats of, of that generation. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that same day, uh, uh, great actor Crispin Glover. Uh, but I like to I like to uh, kind of characterize him as uh, one of the biggest fans of our Kubrick series. <laughs> uh, in spite of all of his accomplishments, I think that's that's what makes him most special in my heart. Uh, River's Edge. Uh, in our interview with him, he said that this was his favorite movie that he did. Um, and this, best this, coming of age movie I saw at the time. This, and this was also this also marked a great. Uh, Resurgence in in uh, Hopper's career. Mm-hmm. Did this this was because there was Blue Velvet. Yeah, Blue Velvet is before. Um, yeah, Blue Velvet, Velvet Hoosiers, mm-hmm. River's Edge. I mean that trio is amazing. For mm-hmm. It's Chainsaw yeah. Massacre too. Also, it kicks off with Chainsaw Massacre too. It's Chainsaw Massacre two. Yeah, I, I left that off for a reason. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's a good. River's Edge was, for me at least, I was in 11th grade and going, and I, I don't think I watched it till I didn't see it till it came out on videotape, because I don't think it, it didn't, it was not, it did not come out in that many places, I think, it was a, um, so I don't remember going to see it, but, in the theater, but I saw it on videotape, and it was, just, like, one of the most, uh, at least at that time, one of the most honest movies I had seen um, of what it meant to be a teenager, um, I, at least for me. I mean, right. Right, maybe I could say Dennis. Speaking of Dennis Hopper, out of the blue, but I, I don't. I, and I watched that earlier that year, or for Penelope Spears is Suburbia, maybe. But for me, River's Edge really just more so than John Hughes at the time really spoke to me. Well, I watched it, and I was thankful that wasn't my reality. As no, no, it was. It, it just but I, I could relate to it. The scene where then I thought there was a scene in the. You got to forgive me. It's been twenty five years, I think, since I've seen it. Um. Or maybe twenty two. Um, but there's a scene where they're in class and in, in you know, it's, there's a lot of cynicism in it that I could relate to at the time mm-hmm. when they're they're talking back to the teacher and everything and it just is very i I had not seen something like that in an American film I, at that time. I, I admire the acting in River's Egg and mm-hmm. it's Keanu, it's a good Keanu, it's early Keanu Reeves, he's very good. Crispin Glover is kind of a uh, him at that time him and Nicholas Cage were the, the two neck and neck freakiest actors that you had. Very exciting. Obviously, Dennis Hopper is very good. Uh, I So I admire the acting. Like, in, to a certain extent, to a lesser extent, like Casualties of War, I don't... There was a lot of... There's a lot of this putting emphasis on River's Edge that it that it, it it's a testament to the... You know, to a certain part of, you know, youth that's kind of, you know, morally bankrupt or whatever. Where I don't... I. I, I think it's given kind of a stature that uh, is not really that emblematic. I think it's it's taking a an incident and trying to give it extra significance, right. and that is something that I I kind of uh, I resent is too strong a word, but I kind of just kind of I, I sort of roll mine. It's kind of like like in Casualties of War, they're using this De Palma's using this isolated this this incident of of this rape and murder, and he's making this claim that, see, this is in microcosm what happened to Vietnam, where it's not that simple of right. the Vietnam, Vietnam War. So, once again, this incident, was, you know, this this true incident that Rivers Egg dramatizes is not 
emblematic of teenagers in the 80s. I think a more honest one by the same director uh, came out eight years earlier was Over the Edge. I think right, that's Matt more, Dillon, yeah. I think mm-hmm. that's more more honest about kind of re, you know you know bankrupt teenage or however you want to want to want to put it. Is that what they were feeling? This was like a you you have to forgive me. Is this how it was marketed at the time? Um, a lot of the op ed a lot of the praise it got, a lot of the re, you know praise it got was in that in that vein that this is frightening when when you know the, because these kids don't have this uh, they're not shocked by this incident. You know I I, I remember. You know, and, and I try not to quote her because I don't want, you know, I don't want to, I don't, I just don't like it. But I do remember Pauline Kael made the point of, you know, one of the characters says, you know, how come I don't feel anything? I felt something when I saw Brian's song. And Pauline Kael pointed out, well, Brian's song is, is, man, is, arch- you know, is, is manufactured, designed to create an emotional response, to manipulate an emotional response. So, yes, you're going to have an emotional response to Brian's song. But the incident that these kids are dealing with, I mean, uh, one of the one of the reactions you're going to have is shock and numbness. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, so. I think that no movie can, can uh, hmm. no single movie really captures the totality of the teenage experience because it's it's all it's it's yeah. oh, that's that's a wide landscape there. Yes, yeah, right. but I think what what's interesting about this movie is how how much it contrasts with something like Stand by Me. <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, the, it's it's a different kind of uh, it's a different feeling of adolescence uh, when they happen upon a dead body and what that inspires. I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a very different kind of track Pete, on that. Any? Uh, have you seen River's Edge? Um, that's the uh, one I actually have not. So I okay, well, uh, have go. to catch up so, with it at some point. Yeah. Are you are uh, you, you down can... are you down with the Crispin Glover? You down with the freaky? Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> There was, you know, it, just to kind of circle back quickly to the Dark Knight Rises, you know, the first negative review was uh, Marshall Fine's review, and, and that kind of broke Rotten Tomatoes um, in its own way. And uh, when that happened, I was just reminded of something I saw on Twitter from a from a friend of mine who's uh, named Michael Shashinsky, who's very into uh, experimental film and everything, and, and he had done this whole thread of, like, you know, take a critic's name and, and turn it into, and put make it into a movie uh, or, or put their name into like a movie title or whatever and uh, this is the Crispin Glover connection he, d- he did uh, It Is Fine Everything Is Marshall Fine mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 which, just, which just tickled me to no end and, that's uh, great so, so, when this happened, so when that happened to Marshall you know who, who, who handled it like a pro and everything you know it's just kind of I just and, and uh, then a fr- another critic friend of mine tweeted hey remember back in the day when, when you were like you know, beset by uh, all these Dark Knight haters uh, or Dark Knight people who who didn't like that you hated the movie, and uh, and I and I just tweeted back, it is fine, everything is Marshall fine mm-hmm. because he got the brunt of it this <laughs> time great. out, so I don't have to fucking worry about that. That's and, great. Anyway, so yeah, but, uh, go on. And R- River's Edge is, uh, I mean, I, I watch it. Uh, if I watch it, I enjoy Dennis Hopper in it, and I, I can almost tell that he came to the set with. These great, crazy, inventive, off-the-wall ideas. Right. I wouldn't be surprised if the blow-up doll was his idea, <laughs> and they just incorporated that into the script. And that's one of the most memorable aspects of the movie for me too. That that blow-up doll. Uh, okay, the next week, <laughs> uh, a film that will live in infamy. <laughs> Ishtar. 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 Yeah. Who doesn't love? Ishtar, if only to bash it. Uh, you know, you know, I do not love Ishtar, and there is a there is a thing going on, right? Uh, you know, a sort of a movement to reconstitute the film as a misunderstood masterpiece among my uh, many of my colleagues. You know, maybe you heard um, that in New York um, a little while back there was a screening of Elaine May's director's cut of the film. Right. Which I believe is a little shorter than the theatrical cut. Um, it and, was the uh, Margaret of its day. Yeah, well, that's that seemed to be what a lot of people were trying to say, um, and you know, it, it screened at the 92Y. It was apparently a packed crowd and a very appreciative audience. And Elaine May, as she always is, she's a great talent, you know. And in, and in person, I mean, I, I have to direct everybody to watch Elaine May's speech to Mike Nichols at the AFI because it is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. I mean, she is a hilarious woman, you know, just, and yes. just a hilarious comic. 
in so many ways. Um, and, you know, she made a great, several great films like A New Leaf, um, which is her first movie, and Mikey and Nicky, and, uh, um, and, and it's just like, you know, I, I've watched Ishtar. Um, Ishtar is sort of funny at the start because the songs are intentionally bad and there's kind of like, you know, the two guys kind of riffing with each other, Warren mm-hmm. Beatty and uh, Dustin Hoffman, and then it just fucking dies. Uh, I, I, it goes to the Middle East, and it's just dead. Like and everything else, it goes there. <laughs> I, I, and, and I just, uh, you know, it, it ceases. It ceases to be funny, and and it's it's kind of am, it kind of amazes me that people are trying to reconstitute it now. And I mean, you know, I'm I'm no one to speak uh, in that sense because there are plenty of films that I uh, like or love that uh, are not universally mm-hmm. praised at all. I mean, I I would think honestly we probably all have those, and you right. could probably do a whole show surrounding no, that. As a matter of as a matter well, of fact, I, I, Jamie, I I would say you should you know do a show. Well, I I think I think it I think it's kind of I don't think that's anything new, and I I think that uh, it, it's simply because it's it's an infamous flop, and with all the infamous flops, whether it be Heaven's Gate or Revolution, uh, there's always a movement decades later <laughs> to kind of resuscitate it into some kind of, you know, this this is a forgotten masterpiece, and I mean you're right, it absolutely does not fit with with Ishtar. It has its pleasures, but that's a that's a deeply like divided movie and I think most people agree that it really it, just like you said it really dies when it tries to take on that Hope Crosby uh, try, you know when it goes to the Middle East section of the film uh, and I actually it's one of the few movies that the experience of that movie and, and its failures were really kind of elucidated for me when I read the, the Peter Biskin's Warren Beatty uh, biography because I, I wasn't aware of a lot of the behind the scenes goings on in Ishtar. And uh I thought it was I thought it was also very funny that Hoffman knew from the very start that that he was in an awful movie. Like he didn't want to do it from the very beginning. But he said, you know, I've had so much success I'm I might as well do one that's 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 really gonna tank and hurt me. And, but you know, but he knew that the project was doomed. I mean it was kind of directionless and Elaine May was was kind of thwarted thwarted from the start, and this was a much bigger film than she had previously attempted, and it just got it's just one of those things that got out of control. And when you have uh, certain people of that caliber in your film too, I mean, uh, sometimes ego comes into play, and that uh, that affects. Uh, there's the a lot of thing. ego. Yeah. Between Hoffman yeah. and Beatty, there's a lot of fucking ego. Yeah, you know? and you can tell of those those kind of warring it's factions. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of like you know the HBO series Luck recently, which I really love. You know, but talk, you know, there's like there's there's what you need when you have egos. You need three like dominant egos, like Michael Mann, Dustin Hoffman, and uh, David Milch, like right. all arguing back and forth. You know, because that and it's kind of like one is the head of the writing, one is the head of the filming, and one is the head of the acting. And it's like you can feel that, and it kind of creates this great kind of tripartite. You know, they raise they raise thing. each other's game, mm-hmm. but in, yeah. in this case, because, in this because case, they're constantly challenging each other. And May is brilliant. I love Elaine May, but she she doesn't have, I don't think, the the temperament really to deal with Beatty and Hoffman. You know, and, and none of them were on the same page of what the movie should be. I mean, essentially, uh, yeah. And you and you feel that it's yeah. a it, it's, deeply conflicted not, movie. It's not a good movie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but an interesting, an interesting kind of an interesting one, yes. Because yeah. the, well, here's the, the it's not a good movie. Is it as bad as it was claimed to be when it when it mm. came out? Because when those re, when it for, when it came out, the reviews were, you know, the vitriolic it, reviews of its day. So that's they were reviewing the, the budget first. You know, I mean, yeah, that's that's, yeah. that's a huge problem right there. And now. And now you hear like fifty million dollars, and that's like a, that's like an independent, you know, <laughs> yeah. nowadays, which, which is perverse. You know, I mean, for God's sake, we, uh, we're gonna. I bet we're gonna get to uh, something, and maybe James Cameron is gonna direct it. God knows, or someone like that. We're, a movie that's gonna cost a billion dollars. I, I mm-hmm. just feel like that's probably coming down the pike. How the hell do you raise money for that? 
<laughs> oh, if you're James Cameron, you can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, really he, probably, he probably won't be far off with the, the three avatars back to back. You know, and it'll be shot in space, or or on the moon, or something like that. And on location, you know, I like it. Well, the, yeah. the tax the tax incentives for out of state filming are, <laughs> are out of planet filming. Yeah. Out of planet it's filming. Like, it's like, Th- that and and stereoscopic technology or sca- stereoscopic projection technology without the glasses, I think is mm-hmm, probably going to mm-hmm. come down the pike. I, I feel yeah. like you know three D three D is a is a bridge to something where basically you're going to see you know, like what you saw in I don't know if you all saw the miniseries Wild Palms from '93. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah some, something like that. Where or Minority Report, you know, where where, where where essentially it's projected into you know, the space that you are inhabiting. You're basically inhabiting the space of the movie. I feel like that's probably right. the next step. And I'm excited for that. You know, uh, I, I hope I get to see something like that. Don't have to wear um, those damn but, glasses. Uh, yeah. Well, that, yeah that, that, exactly. all, that, all that being said, uh, none of that would have helped Ishtar. No, I, I, you're right. <laughs> no, 3D I, I, would I know, not I know have you're right. <laughs> yeah, I watched this chart. I thought if only this were in 3D, I would. It, it would be. It would be a much better experience. Uh, okay, do we want to talk about the gate? I don't know anything about. No, the gate. I, 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 I don't. I mean, unless, unless okay. someone else does. I mean, I, I, I will just say, I will just say on the gate. The gate, I believe, is infamous for having beat Ishtar at the box office. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> am I right? I yeah, none so. of us know anything about it. That's great. And, and or and or give it a run for its. Uh, it, for I think its it actually it was money. like number one or number two for oh, that weekend, and um, it's on Netflix. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, so that's about all I'd have to say about that. Check it out if you're only if you're a 1987 completist. Check out. <laughs> uh, the next week uh, we had we had a sequel to a surprise smash hit, you know, like a global smash hit, which mm. was Beverly Hills Cop. And this one was even bigger in every way, but uh, definitely not necessarily better. Beverly Hills Cop 2, Tony no, Scott's I, treatment. I vaguely I, remember I will, this. I mean, what I'll say, I'll say about Beverly Hills Cop 2 is that you're right, Gaming was a sequel, obviously, to the surprise hit. Uh, still one of the all-time top-grossing R-rated comedies of all time, Beverly, the original Beverly Hills Cop. Interesting about Beverly Hills Cop 2, uh, it was the number one grossing film of that summer, and I think the number one, the number two grossing film of the year, uh, just in the end being beat out by Three Men and a Baby. But that's another story for another day. But God, Beverly Hills America Cop, has no taste sometimes. I'm hey, sorry. Hey, three men, and a, three men and a baby's cute. But here's the, uh, but that's not a here another. The thing about Beverly Hills Cop 2 was interesting. It was finally Eddie Murphy, the biggest star at that moment, uh, finally doing a summer film that was all about him. Uh, and Tony Scott coming off of the big film of the previous year, the previous summer, Top Gun, with the biggest producers. Simpson and Bruckheimer, you know. So, I mean, it was going to be the film of the summer. Everyone was anticipating it, and it was one of those films everyone went to. uh, Everyone bought, you know, it was one of these, you know, it happens now, you know, people talk about this happening now, but it happened in, it was one of those films that everybody wanted to, everybody felt they had to see. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everybody did go see. Everybody did buy the soundtrack. Everybody did embrace the film, but it's one of those that no one, you know, I, I defy anyone to tell me that they actually like truly like Beverly Hills Cop 2. Uh, mm-hmm. Eddie Murphy is just kind of an action figure. There's no conflict. You know, the whole thing, what, make, what gives the first Beverly Hills Cop some wit and some, you know, is that he is up against the, the status quo, up against the, 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 the Beverly Hills establishment. In Beverly Hills Cop 2, he is the establishment. Yeah, there's yeah. No, there's no I mean, conflict. The, the, yeah. yeah, you're it's absolutely it's right. A, um, it's a fish out of water in the, in, in the first one, and then... You know, he 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 owns the ocean in the second one. I think, and I think this is the one. I would even argue, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm obviously more of a Tony Scott fan than Keith is, but I would even argue that even Tony Scott did this because he knew it, it it was you know it was good for him. But this is one that even he doesn't really talk about much. And the fact that he took uh, basically three years off before he did another film, um, and the next film he does is Days of Days of Thunder. Now we can all make fun of Days of Thunder, but you know, Days of Thunder does has some 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 dramatic moments that resonate. Beverly Hills Cop Two has nothing that uh, 
that uh, resonates. Well, it's a dead exercise, and, and I, I don't remember it that well. It, 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 it tries to put like Tony. It tries to put Axafoli in the. Well, it does put Axafoli in the in the world of Tony Scott. So that's that's a lot of gloss and a lot of smoke and a lot of TNA. I mean, they try to make it a very kind of sexy, mm. hard uh, R action film. And the, and the comedic smoke. the comedic elements don't feel organic at all to the mm-hmm. material. It, it kind of feels like, okay, now now we're going to insert a little comedy bit so Eddie can do what he does, and then we'll get back to all the, the guns mm-hmm. and tits. It's, it's Did you the, say organic and Tony Scott in the same sentence? I, uh, Come on, Keith, that's it. not fair, man. I know. I, <laughs> but I, no. it is, I, to me, it's fair. I, I, I can't abide Tony Scott, but I know I, there's, that's another... I mean, that's another he, show. But this, well, I, I, I was saying show. it in contrast to the first one. That uh, right. It, it, right. It, the first one it felt more organic, and then this one it's a, mm. it seemed and, to and be, let's get this had, out of the way. And Eddie Murphy at this time, and sadly, uh, he was so popular, he was bulletproof. There was an ease and charm in the first Beverly Hills Cop. That's not fair. It, it's more arrogant. Uh, it, interestingly enough, the better film, Eddie Murphy film from '87, is Eddie Murphy Raw, which is also and in your face, Eddie Murphy, but there's an honesty, a brutal honesty in his stand-up in that film that is lacking from Beverly Hills Cop uh, 2. So, so after Beverly Hills Cop, he does Golden Child and Beverly Hills Cop 2. Wow. Okay. Golden, I will do, Golden Child does have, and you know, it's a bad film also, but there's actually some genuinely funny scenes in Golden Child as opposed to there's nothing genuinely funny in Beverly Hills mm-hmm. Cop 2. What is interesting is that the following summer, coming, you know, next year also we'll talk about it, coming to America, he has mm-hmm. a relaxed ease and romantic charm that uh, he, you know, that he tried, that he should embrace more. But yeah, yeah, Beverly Hills yeah, Cop yeah. 2 is, a, is just a... Uh, it doesn't, just, it's, doesn't work. I don't think it's it's it works. sound and work. fury signifying uh, nothing. And I would, I would argue that that is the... That, that movie represents truly the worst of bankrupt, high-concept 80s movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I, would would go, I would go with that, certainly. Mm-hmm. That being said, we're going to close off tonight's show later with a, a song from Beverly Hills Cop 2. Oh, I hope it. Well, well and <laughs> that is the one, the one good thing out of Beverly Hills Cop. I will stick up for the salacious and controversial, at the time, George Michael song from that soundtrack, the uh, I Want Your Sex, which... Yeah. Uh, Remember, 1987 was kind of the flashpoint year of AIDS, and this song kind of—I uh, remember—I I remember vividly this song was just, uh, you know, kind of vilified uh, that year. As Tony Scott should be. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. George Michael. George Michael. Come on, George. It's, it's a George. I, Tony Scott. I'm, I'm just. I'm just. I'm just fucking with you. I'm just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, but and see the last was, Boy was, Scout again, man. See the last Boy Scout. It was still a. It was still a $277 million worldwide hit, but yeah. it was got to. And that back then yeah. was a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Yeah, that was back when $277 billion was a lot of money. For a movie, yeah, worldwide gross. Yeah, you're right. It would be something. a lot of money if I got my hands on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I bet it, you and me both, Keith. Yeah. That is something that should be noted, though. That was, I mean, it was really, you know, that was a big thing of Eddie Murphy, African-American uh being, you know, the number one star basically in the world. Um and that that yeah, was sure there were a lot of think pieces written about that, but yeah. anyway. not then actually. Not then. But uh well. that was something that that was something that needed to be cause he actually had a he had a number one song that year with the uh right. Party right. All the Time. The great yeah. Party All the Time produced by Rick James. Uh speaking of the number one African American box office draw uh at yeah. this stage, uh, Ernest goes to camp. Also released. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's the it's really bad movies. I have no recollection or never <laughs> saw. I, Jim the Varney, only, man, he wrote the that. Only out. Ernest. No, I have memories of two Ernest movies. One was Ernest goes to jail because my uh, f- my uncle in Florida took me to see that. He's like, "Hey, Keith, do you want to go see Ernie goes to jail?" I was like, "What? <laughs> Ernie goes to jail?" Uh, and because he took me to see that, and I thought it was reasonably funny, I, I remember then I went to see Ernest Scared Stupid, and I was just like, "This is the worst." Shit ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but isn't Ernest goes to camp the first Ernest movie? Yes, it is. 
yeah, the biggest okay. hit the biggest hit of the Ernest films is the eighty eight holiday hit Ernest Saves Christmas. Ernest How do we we're, save we're, well, he stops the sleigh from from crashing, you know, going down what was vertically, the and then he turns to the camera and goes, air brakes. Yeah, <laughs> there you God. go. Jesus. Good old Jim Varney. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, bless him. He he knew who he was, and he, and he did it. And, he redeemed yeah. himself with the Toy Story movies, though. And 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 when he and when he passed, I I felt the twinge of sadness. Well, of course, of course. Um, yeah. Well, wow. it, it seems like I, I wonder if he's if he's wherever he is now, if he's looking down and looking at the blue collar comedy tour success and thinking, damn, mm. I, I could have really capitalized on that. Like that I think he's would have been my time. I think he'd love file yeah. a lawsuit against all of them. They all stole my act. No, I think he's looking up and thinking that. But, oh, 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 no, Aaron. No. Aaron. Jim Varney is not in hell. No. <laughs> that's, that's a sound bite that I'm going to pull. That is that's another, that's, 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 the, that's the reboot. That's the name of this episode. Jim no, Varney is not no, in hell. No, that's the reboot of the Ernest series. Jim Varney is not in hell. <laughs> With Jim Ernest, Ernest, no, no, Ernest goes okay. to hell. Oh, Ernest no. goes to hell. <laughs> Do you see? Starring Jeremy Renner as Ernest. Jer- Oh, right. There goes Jeremy Renner's career. All right. Um, who's, who's playing Satan? Tony Scott. Uh, Sorry. Anyway, Tom yeah. Sizemore. <laughs> there you go. As Tom Sizemore, as himself. Oh wow, poor Tom Sizemore. Anyway, okay. okay. I just, I just want to say to kind of cleanse our palate of this. Uh, yeah, we, I have very warm feelings about Jim Varney. <laughs> I do too. It I should do. roll. I do too. Uh, June 1987. What came out right. Memorial Day weekend? Was that Beverly Hills Cop 2? Yeah, that was yeah. Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, right out of the gate, June 3rd, The Untouchables, which I vividly <laughs> yes. remember seeing opening okay. weekend. Okay, yeah. Um, hmm. I didn't see it opening weekend, um, but yeah. The thing that stuck in my mind from The Untouchables for so many years is the girl getting blown up. Um, you hey, know, when, Mr., when she... you forgot your briefcase. The little yeah, girl, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That, I remember that fucked me up something fierce, and uh, and yet and this was this was the movie I think that kind of made me aware of a Brian De Palma and b the Hitchcock thing mm-hmm. you know that he always gets tagged with not wrongly necessarily but you know I have a more you know, a complicated take on it than I think people who just say you're stealing from Hitchcock and all that right. but uh, this is a movie that uh, I will say that on a revisit. Uh, a, a relatively recent, re- well, uh, relatively recent in the sense of like when the De Palma series came around uh, in, uh, in in New York. I think it was back in like '06 or whatever. Mm-hmm. I rewatched The Untouchables, and um, it uh, played as one of the weaker De Palma films because mm-hmm. I think the movie is kind of uh, more uh, more a product of its script by Mamet, which mm-hmm. is uh, which is which is a really queasy. You know, uh, I, I don't quite know how to say it, but his political conversion to what he is now it almost seems portended in some ways by oh, yeah. what what the Untouchable script is, mm-hmm. and it's very uncomfortable, and and I don't like that very much, and I don't feel, and I feel like the only real scene that is pure De Palma, and I'm sure you know all know what it's going to be is the staircase scene, yeah. which is you know, which which is both Hitchcock and Eisenstein, right, right, but the problem, together. the problem. And I like The Untouchables as as a fun popcorn summer mm-hmm. movie. It is very square. Uh, I yeah. do think Costner is very is the weak link. You know, I, I like I like Garcia. I like I like Charles Martin Smith. Oh. I like Connery, obviously De Niro and all. Costner is square. But the the thing is, though, you know, uh, you know, and I and I know people who do criticize. You know, and I'm not just saying you keep them. Just saying people who they you know they say, well, the the weakness any weakness of the film is the Mammoth script, and that is true. The Mammoth script. Is is you know very square and kind of weak, but I do think also De Palma is complicit in that, and also yes, the staircase scene is terrific. But the thing is, unlike certain set pieces in the Palma film, be it the museum piece in Dress to Kill or anything from Blowout and so forth, that the set piece the set pieces in the De Palma in in the Antarctic, be it the staircase or when Charles Martin Smith is about to get killed in the elevator and the camera is kind of tracking the hallway, or even Sean Connery's death scene, there's no POV of the camera. There's all, 
always there's always been you knew what the POV was. In these set pieces in the Untouchable, the POV is just well, the Palmer basically saying, well, I have this idea. I want to do this kind of mashup of uh, Potemkin and Hitchcock with this baby right. carriage and the shootout, and it's awesome. But you know, we're talking you know we're talking about organic, but it's not organic with the rest of the film. It's like the no, film exactly. It's the I, film I, yeah, that's stopped. true. Yeah. I would absolutely unlike, agree with that. It stops unlike, basically for this great set piece that is not yeah. connected to anything else. Yeah, unlike Carlito's um, Way, interestingly oh, enough, God, which also has which also has a you know, a train station set piece with Pacino going up and down here. But that one feels Oh god, that scene is devastating. I'm sorry, I'm just replaying <laughs> the, the train scene mm-hmm. from Carlito's Way in my but head. That, just, that scene ha- that scene feels organic. Oh, as absolutely. A, as right. opposed to well, I mean, no, no, I mean, any any lover of De Palma kind of knows that he gets off on the, on the sequences. I mean, right. and there are some films yeah. that he does where he can't wait to get past all the all the dialogue and setup bullshit, so he could he could just Mission express himself visually. Would you uh, say that? I want, let me ask you this, Keith. You know, you talk about kind of the queasiness of the mammoth politics, and it is there, but you got to you will acknowledge that even though it might go against one's personal politics, be it vigilantism or whatever, that it works you over like gangbusters. My favorite... Oh, yeah, no, it's, 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 that's the thing. It's a, you know, uh, I would honestly say that maybe the script isn't much of a weakness yeah. uh, in terms of the point that it's arguing, you yeah. know, uh, or in terms of the point that it's arguing because it's in its own way very convincing, you know, and, and it's kind of like you say, everybody's sort of complicit in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, so it's like, you know, to be to be a good critic about it, you have to say, well, the Palma is itself. part of this too. You know, it's not just Mamet. You know, it's like right. everything is kind of working like clockwork. It's easy to see why the movie became a huge hit, you know, when in, in, in a Reagan presidency mm-hmm. and everything, you know, tra- it start in, and in the crossover basically to the Bush presidency. But you I know, think it like, would have been hit, I think it would have been a hit in any, I mean, I, I don't deny that, you know, obviously in the Reagan presidency, the movie kind of fed in, you know, it obviously fed off of that. It fed in, yeah. But, but I, I think a movie that kind of, you know, mechanical into working an audience over, it would have been a sure. hit no matter, you know, yeah. what, you know, it could have been in the Carter era. And it I think could have been Carter, it could be Obama, <laughs> it could be Clinton, yeah. it would have done, it would have... Yeah. I feel. Way. I feel though you know, it's growing out of something. You know. Yeah, that is true. Those, is those guys. Out. Those those guys work. You know the way they the the way both of those guys work. They work very much within the moments that they're in. I think you know Mam- Mamet and and De Palma. I think they they kind of take from where they are, and uh, I, I feel like that an Untouchables made in say a Carter era or an Obama era or a Clinton era or whatever, it wouldn't be the same Untouchables. It would it, it would it would be different. You know, it's kind of like I mean, it's sort of I guess the way like you know if you imagine them doing Boardwalk Empire now or something. You know, right, I'd enough. love to I'd, I'd love to see De Palma do a Boardwalk Empire mm-hmm. episode. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that'd be yeah. wonderful. But um, um, it was daring though for them. I mean, the movie does have you would kill off a major Hollywood icon. Right, in a movie, yeah. and that was something in Art Linson's *A Pound of Flesh* that he recounts a scene where the Palma said, "I want to kill Sean Connery. I want to, I want to kill him on screen. I want to kill, yeah. you know, this heart, you know, this A-list, you know, you know, this icon. I want to and kill James great, Bond, essentially." It's a great scene, except for uh, uh, Costner's emoting of banging the floor three <laughs> times mm-hmm. and saying, "No, no," then no, pause, you know. "No." I, I do- I, I do I do want to point out that uh, the Untouchables and it's not the best it's not really the best role it's just basically a supportive wife role but it marked the film debut of the great 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 Patricia Clarkson. Oh, she's That's wonderful. right. Yeah. She, and yeah. oddly it, enough, she she it's a thankless role and thankless she does in better, every way. She does better in another kind of Reagan era icon, you know, kind of pro Reagan film, The Fallen Year. She does better in the Deadpool. Yeah, uh, but 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 I will I will say this because I I have uh, met Patricia Clarkson through uh, Iris Sachs who directed her in Married Life and uh, I actually asked her about The Untouchables and she had nothing but praise for Ryan De Palma. She said yeah he lives in my building and he gave me my first shot and you know I'm I'm eternally grateful to him for that. Did, did so, Kevin uh, that, hit that, on her? 
Uh, maybe he did. I don't know. <laughs> we, I did, we didn't get that far. But, okay. uh, no, but I, I was more interested in like, oh, what was Brian De Palma like and all that. And, and she was just like, he's, he's an absolute sweetheart. I love him. And he gave me my start. And uh, I will be, she said, I'll be forever grateful for that. And so uh, for that, thank you, Brian, for doing that because she is a, she is a treasure. And uh, hopefully she'll get, you know, uh, a good, uh, she'll, she'll, she'll be fondly remembered. Uh, and gave Billy Drago his... Gave Billy Drago his most memorable. Oh role. yeah, Billy Drago. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your friend died screaming like a stuck Irish pig. <laughs> there's, there's our Billy Drago impression for that. Yeah, there's a good Billy Drago. That's a good one. Um, Next one. Uh, okay. Uh, do we want to talk about Benji the Hunted or no? <laughs> if if Ebert was really rem- I, I if have Ebert no was here, Ebert Dude, would defend yeah. that movie. Yeah, that is one of the rem- all-time. Do you remember? Do you remember the Ebert? Cisco contra temp over that because that yes. was awesome. That was awesome, and I yes, I may I not that. like Benji the Hunted. Because Ebert had Benji the Hunted, and and Cisco many years, several years later had Carnosaur, and that was the joke on the critic, you know, the animated yeah. series when they had the Cisco and Ebert episode. Yeah. You know, he, and when when Cisco's like this from the man who liked Benji the Hunted, and and Ebert's like, well, you like Carnosaur, you know, and those were like. <laughs> That was I, like, I, was, I remember the Benji the Hunted as it related to the, uh, I think it was their Full Metal Jacket review. It Cause was. Because Ebert was lukewarm on Full Metal Jacket, and Siskel said, mm-hmm. you gave a positive review to Benji the, Hunted, Benji the Hunted, and 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 you're not uh, crazy about Full Metal Jacket? And <laughs> his argument was, well, it's it all has to do with you know amb- the, the movie's particular ambitions and how well it lives up to those ambitions. And, <laughs> yeah, it was a he, whole he, thing. He, act, he says, Benji the Hunted... Hits its mark on what it wants to be. He goes, Full Metal Jacket, he felt, fell short of what it wanted to be. So, going yep. by that comparison, okay. he goes, I, I gotta um, give thumbs up I, to Benji the Hunt. I hope Chris Jacket. Nolan reboots Benji. You hope Chris Nolan what? Reboots of the Benji series. I'd love to see Chris, <laughs> Chris Nolan version of Benji. He'll, he'll ground it in a reality that will really. Uh, Make it very special. A it'll be shot in and, IMAX, and, and, and there will be a like lot of the Benji movie you never forget. I mean, but, and, but, be, and, and Benji will talk and say, I am an agent of chaos, and over and over again. <laughs> but, that, but what, sorry, I, what, I, do, sorry, what okay, I would love I'll about Christopher me. Nolan's treatment of Benji is <laughs> how, it, how it relates so, so closely with the, with the Tea Party <laughs> movement. Uh, so we it, have to. We ha- so if, if whatever we may think of Benji the Hunted, even if we think nothing of it, we must be proud of critics that the fact that Ebert dared to be the one to say, no, this film is good. I don't care what anyone says. And, uh, yeah. bless God him. bless him. I like For the Love of Benji when I was five. Okay. <laughs> okay. But essentially, I think most people, most people think that movie's a dog. Uh, uh, Harry, and the, oh. Harry and the Hendersons came out that day. Harry and the Hendersons. Harry and the Hendersons, yeah. Do we? Wow. Wow. Um, <laughs> That's all we have to uh, well, do. I have a confession you know? to make about this summer. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sleep this summer. I don't think I slept a single night that summer. Because? Because I was really stressed out about the college. It was in my, between my junior and senior year in high school, and I was constantly stressed about the SAT. I mean, there was a lot going on, but the SATs and the college application process like put the fear of God into me. So mm-hmm. I don't think I slept. I watched a lot of Tonight Show and Letterman, though, every night. I remember And Harry that. and the Hendersons, did you watch that? No, I watched period? that. I, got, I rented that on videotape when it came out. I, so it was the off story in it. What I will say, I had a... I will, I'll tell this story. I had a I had a critic friend that I that I interviewed a, a real a well renowned well respected of a nationally syndicated publication critic friend. Tell me a story that he heard from someone at a at a at a party an industry party, and this was like in the late eighties. That uh and that and and this critic loves Steven Spielberg's work, loves it to death. Mm-hmm. But in the eighties. Uh, at one point, uh, this this friend this friend's friend was at this party and met Spielberg, and Spielberg said, "Oh yeah, I work with this critic." And uh, Spielberg said, "He's kind of an asshole, isn't he?" And the reason that prompted Spielberg to say this is because at this point in this mid '80s era, uh, is that Spielberg was really ramping up kind of the Steven Spielberg Amblin Entertainment presents mm-hmm. and kind of doing these uh, these kind of cookie cutter family films, and right. he was giving pans to all of these. So, I mean, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
Harry and Henderson's batteries not included. Goonies kind of direct Amer- an, an American tale, if you will. So you, I think. Her- yeah. yeah. So I think I Harry and Henderson is is, is, is is part is part of that that first wave of Spielberg branding that you know a lot of critics kind of resisted and resented. And here's what we should say about Harry and the Hendersons, and hopefully it'll be a good segue into uh, another film that came out relatively close to it. Harry was played by Kevin Peter Hall, uh, yeah. very okay, very I know tall where we're man, going. Okay. who also uh, who played in this family film, but also played in a very uh, violent and very fun action mm-hmm. sci-fi film as well with one of the big action stars of the time. Um, and I don't quite know, Jamie. You probably have in front sure. of you what uh, dates what dates uh, these came out. Uh, <clears throat> it was the next week. Hen- it was the next week. So we got two weeks of Kevin Peter Hall. Um, it, one in in the first week we got him as Harry the Sasquatch, and in the second week we got him as Predator. Right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Because if I named the wrong movie after that after that build up, I would have yeah, that would million like, dollar, <laughs> million dollar movie? a big blooper, man. He was a million dollar movie? No. Uh, yeah, million dollar movie. Yeah. Wasn't Jean Claude Van Damme originally supposed to play the Predator? Yes. I uh, but believe I think, so, yeah. but I think yes. Yes, but I think I I can't doing? remember if the suit was too hot or it just didn't work out or something. It had something to, I think it had something to do with the suit. And so I'm he uh, Oh wow, that would have been interesting. According to an interview with director John McTiernan, the Hole in the Jungle appearance of the Predator was played by Jean-Claude Van Damme in a blue screen, actually red suit. Van Damme quit after two days, unhappy with being cast as an uncredited special effect, but can be seen as the Predator in If It Bleeds, We Can Kill It, the making of Predator. The alien was scrapped, redesigned, and was eventually played by Kevin Peter Hall. So, yeah, he started for... Van Damme started for two days, and then... One of the, one of the great... Over. One of the great 80s action lines, too. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Uh, I mean, that, yeah. that's just a great line. Yes, yeah. we can kill it. Yeah. <laughs> that that, what's, so the, what's, the, what's the line that uh, they... When uh, Dutch and him first meet Jamie? I, I mean, uh, the when they start doing the uh, arm wrestling? Uh, yeah. Dylan! <laughs> Dylan, yeah, you son of a bitch. You son of a bitch. <laughs> What's the matter, Dylan? Been pushing too many pencils? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> it was a good oh, movie. Man. It was a fun, fun movie. And and, and it, it started it started like the trend where, you know, every Stallone movie, every Stallone action movie at the time, he would scream out at some point in the movie, Get out of there! And in, in, Stallone, in Schwarzenegger movies, I think in multiple ones, he says, Get to the chopper! Like, <laughs> Get to the chopper. <laughs> Well, Remember and if you, John McTiernan was awesome. God, yes. that was so great. Well, and I will say that I, mean, I love Predator too, but uh, it's funny um, when when I wrote about another '87 movie, I quoted Ebert's re- opening line of his review of Predator, and uh, see what y'all think. And his Ebert's opening line was, "Predator starts like Alien and ends like no, starts like Rambo, ends like Alien, and in today's Hollywood, that's considered originality." Uh, and was he was panning it? No, no, he he praised it. No, he, he loved. They loved Schwarzen- the early yeah. Schwarzenegger. Both well, of them. And, uh, okay, Ebert, good. So, so Ebert was a Predator fan, but he was uh, he was just commenting on that, and I'm sure he was right that I'm sure the pitch for Predator was uh, Alien meets Rambo. Now, obviously, we yeah, know yeah. that Predator is more original than that, but I'm sure the reason it got green lit was because of uh, was uh, because of that. Uh, that oh, yeah. is also a reversal of Terminator. He's the one who's being hunted now. So yeah. right, and you you all should read uh, Kenji's piece on it because he gets into exactly the thing. This is this is a movie like uh, where Schwarzenegger, you know, starts out very much in the in the iconic action hero mode that uh, he he was known for then, and over the course of the film, kind of gets brought down to the point where he has to basically fight for his life against mm-hmm. this. Alien. He's sort of like perfectly matched now. It's no longer. Remember when I said I'd kill you last? I lied. You know, it's like mm-hmm. he, he 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 becomes kind of powerless in some ways, and or you know, and he has to and he has to sort of think his way out of it in a way that he hadn't uh, in some of the, in, in in a film like Commando or whatever, where he's just like with ease will mow down everyone, and you and you know there's like no danger. And I feel like with Predator, there's a real sense that you know he's. At the very least, he could get, you know, 
very horribly hurt. <laughs> I do like the yeah. fact that the Predator obviously is picking off everyone, and you know no one is can defend themselves. But when it gets yeah. when uh, he it gets close to uh, Schwarzenegger, uh, Schwarzenegger gets uh, only shot in the arm. Right. Uh, so I I love that little that little yeah. touch. Uh, and, and actually, and actually, also another thing Kenji points out is that uh, Schwarzenegger ultimately doesn't kill the predator; uh, the mm-hmm. predator kills itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's kind of like you're kind of denied even the hero. You know, saying like Bennett, let off some steam. You know, <laughs> yeah. you don't really get that moment. Right. It's kind mm-hmm. of just like. You, you get you get the you want ugly motherfucker and uh, <laughs> that's a great line. The dude. imitation <laughs> style is just spot on. That's great. That's Eric, you want to do another? You want to do another Billy Drago? Uh, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. I, I'm, no, that was Aaron. I, I, don't, know, I, don't, I don't know. I don't do imitation. I don't know. I don't think Billy Drago no, had any other lines uh, in Untouchables other than you know your friend died screaming like a stuck Irish pig. I think that's all. <laughs> that was the only line Billy Drago had. But yeah. Predator, uh, you know, and I just rewatched Commando last week. Because, God, I love that movie. I, I put that up there yeah, with yeah, Cobra. I mean, that's like Schwarzenegger's Cobra for me. Uh, I, just, yeah. I just love it. Uh, but uh, Predator is uh, – I, I have great love for Predator, yeah. too. Predator mm-hmm. is a great, efficient – it, 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 it it's works. Good, it's it's, it's really – very well, actually. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, the, and that was like the start of like uh, – the, 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 you have the McTiernan kind of awesome trilogy of like Predator, mm-hmm. Die Hard, and The Hunt for Red October. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Nomads, which was the year before. Has anybody seen Nomads? That's the one with Pierce Brosnan, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's been no a long time. Yeah, kind of is horror, that any good? Kind of a horror film. It was, uh, it was, in, it was interesting. I don't. You, you, you've got to forgive me. It, God, it's been a long time, but I, I enjoyed it when I w- watched it, and then went on like I guess video, home video, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, long, right. Right. What I kind of like the one thing I do like about Pre- Predator, and, and and this is something also about Die Hard. I didn't get to when I when I wrote about Die Hard. I didn't, I wanted to point to that, but uh, Predator has uh, not one but two uh, significant supporting roles by African Americans. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Both Bill Duke and Carl, Carl Weathers. Weathers. Right, right. And this is and Bill Duke. Yeah. This is back God, in the day. Bill Duke when, is awesome when he yeah. acts. Mm-hmm. And this is back in the day when you, you know, if you saw more than one African American in a key supporting role, you know, you were seeing, you know, like, what's wrong with this film? You know, and you know, and McTiernan has that kind of openness in his casting. Same thing with Die Hard. Two, uh, three African American mm-hmm. supporting characters. Yeah. And, then, so, and, and, and I think too, there's. there's when, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, at the end of Predator, the credits roll is kind of like everybody sort of breaks character and they kind of look at the yes. at the camera smiling yeah. with their big cigars <laughs> hanging out, and it's all kind of just like a big old lark, and 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 that's just kind of amazing, you know. I feel I feel like that's kind of the spirit of that movie, you know. It, it, it just there's such a sense of fun about it. And, yeah, uh, I think so too. And, yeah, it, it, I, it's it, maybe it's the best film of the summer. I don't know if we want to take votes on that. But, yeah. Well, we'll see. Once we get once we get to the end of it, we'll we'll vote for what we think the the best of that summer was. But yeah. uh I just got I just uh, and we'll move on to the next one, but I just want to say I just got off a McTiernan kick cuz I just bought and watched uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance mm-hmm. and the his Thomas Crown Affair right. uh, mm-hmm. remake. Uh, is he, still I, I in, is he in jail still? Or? I, yes, I think he is. But I I I, I, I love his his his, his stuff. For the oh most no, part. his stuff I'm, is very good. I, we watched Die Hard with a Vengeance. I miss him on cable just recently. You know, the one on the movie channels, and we were watching it. I love that movie. I think it's a great movie. It's a great New York action movie. I yeah. Like and yeah. Uh, and the first time that you see John McClane actually being a cop in New York, I mean, actually. Yeah. What he does, <laughs> what he's known for, and it's the first time you see him do it. Uh, okay, uh, that same week, uh, Martin Sheen. I think this was John Schlesinger. Was it John Schlesinger, the the Believers? Mm. Uh, right. Interesting movie. Yeah, I, I think I think it was something. I could be wrong. I can't remember. That, yeah, it was that, Schlesinger. That, yeah. Yeah, Schlesinger. That movie is only a video cover to me. I, I have not seen it yet, um, but I remember the video cover. Because it freaked me the fuck out. It's like, isn't it like orange or something? It's like mm-hmm. the, the, the kind of Martin Sheen and like, is it Corey Haim who's in it? Uh, no, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the Sheen. Um, it's not. It's not Corey Haim, but it, I don't know the child actor. I don't know if he had a. It's Corey a Corey. Actor. It's a Corey knockoff, obviously. No, it's so. a uh, maybe yeah, but I I don't even remember. But it's, yeah, it's it's like a 
so some some young kid or some young kid or something and like Martin Sheen and and they're like oh, oh no here it is yeah I'm seeing it yeah and they're like and they're like running away and in the background uh, it's like the New York skyline with all these creepy looking mm-hmm. people like projected over it and I just remember seeing that I was like, what the fuck is that That's yeah it, it just like it scared the shit out of me and I just never read it that it deserves it's result, an occult know? it's an occult voodoo movie mm-hmm. that, that that doesn't that isn't entirely successful but I will say this about it its opening sequence is I was just going to say yeah. really terrifying I mean it, Oh, and it's so effective, and that kind of sets the whole thing in motion. And it has nothing to do with the occult or anything, but it's 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 a very like savage opening that just just it's in a very of, like everyday setting that really yeah. And it never captures recaptures that kind it's of. One of those, it was one of those no. those things in the '80s that was starting where okay, we 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 can't build up and you know you know build up interest. We have to grab them by the throat literally from frame one. So, the believers is one is a you know textbook case of okay we have your attention, so you have you know but then they never you know unfortunately they're never you know it's a slippery slope in that they're never able to maintain that kind of level of intensity. It's kind of you know it's kind of like cliffhanger you know mm-hmm. and, but I love cliffhanger but you know you know anyone will tell you the best scene in cliffhanger is the opening scene right mm-hmm. you know so yeah right. yeah uh, I, that's a good I analogy Winnie that's Harlan. a good analogy Aaron. Yes, I invoked Rennie Harlan positively on this show, goddamn. <laughs> well, he's been on the show. We like him. He was good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, that same day, Witches of Eastwick, mm. Cooper Peters, Jack Nicholson, finally playing the devil. I mean, it was about time. I mean, who else would you cast as the devil at that period of time? Yeah, yeah um, you're right. Um, and, a tr- and a trio of strong women, and Michelle Pfeiffer, Susan Sarandon, and Cher. Cher. And, and I, you know, I I I always loved Witches of Eastwick. I, I, I remember I was obsessed with Nicholson mm-hmm. at this period of time when I right. was starting high school. Uh, I think no, it was uh, the tail end of junior high around this time, and I was obsessed with Jack Nicholson. And and I thought, oh well, that's like really delicious to see Jack Nicholson play the devil. And and whatever you think of the movie, he really does sink his teeth. I mm-hmm. mean, he plays that role with relish. Oh, um, the, the silk, the, the silk pajamas, and he's sliding across the bed. I mean, that's just that's fun stuff. Uh, I gotta, I gotta throw in a word here and stick up for. I love the porn title of Witches of Eastwick, which is Witches of Breastwick. I've seen oh. that too. Yeah. yeah. I think they make this into a TV series. And, and that's actually, it, yeah, they, they did. did. It, it failed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now there's a sequel that Updike wrote to this. Um, the, what, I forget, the Widows of Eastwick, I think it was called, or a couple mm. years ago. Yeah. Have you ever yeah. read the book that this is based on? I, I read both. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very, it's a different, quite a different beast. So, um, but it, it is, is very and very sexually graphic. Oh yeah. And, and, I mean, and I, what what, yeah. what is in the movie actually? You know, the the couple of references that he makes when he beats Cher. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's pretty pretty graphic, but in a very playful way. It's not it's not as playful in the book actually, but No, 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 of course not. But um it, no, it's a fun, it was a fun, it was a very good movie. Um I enjoy I remember I enjoyed it in And this was a George Miller's follow-up. This was his first non-Mad Max film. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was right after Beyond Thunderdome. And a great supporting performance by Veronica Cartwright, oh, right? How yes. can we we have to mention her? Yeah, yeah, and I love that pink suit that he wears at the mm-hmm. end of it. And, and but it does seem kind of like uh, the movie has a certain charm, and then then they have to then they have to give it the big special effects climax. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's what ex, what's expected, and that segment of the film does feel a little a little uh, dispassionate compared to the mm-hmm. remainder of mm-hmm. it. You know, right. Mm-hmm. Keith, you, have you seen this, or are you you're not? Uh, you know that's that's an, that's actually a George Miller blind spot for me, and I need to catch up on that because he's a very interesting director. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so you've seen uh, Happy Feet, but not uh, not the yeah, Witches I know. of Eastwick. I have okay. not seen the Witches of Eastwick uh, from from the eighties work. Of course, I've seen the Twilight Zone episode he did, which is mm-hmm. fantastic. It's amazing. Um, that and the Joe Dante one are, are the best, of course, and. Right. Um, uh, the, obviously, the Mad Max movies I've seen and everything. It's just this one, for whatever reason, is the oh, yeah. is a blind spot. So uh, th- that's something to catch up. Is this on. our yeah. favorite? Well, I'll say this: Is this our favorite uh, of the big star celebrity portrayals of the devil, or 
do we have votes for Mickey Rourke well, or for I Robert think, De Niro? I think Gabriel I think Byrne and End of Day is just kidding. <laughs> well, I think that actually the one it, it's closest to is out of our options is probably something like Pacino and Devil's Advocate. I but, knew that was coming. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I like... Know. I like Pacino's kind of ph- philosophy. I mean, I like how they present the devil and the whole free will <laughs> aspect in that movie. Right. He's a sadist. <laughs> but it had it had to be done. You know, it's like if if you if of all the devil movies, you had to have Nicholson play the devil. And I think he actually plays the devil exactly the way we want to see Nicholson play the devil. Mm-hmm. I mean, not not a morose devil, a devil that that is that loves being the devil. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean uh, that, that's it. I mean, he's a horny little devil. That's what it is, and that's what we want Nicholson to be. The movie actually is was like extremely uh, troubled um, in its production, and I know that all three of the actresses were miserable doing it, and they were miserable doing it because of the the producers. And uh, and and Nicholson was very gallant many times and stepped in to defend the ladies and. And just went out of his way to be a complete gentleman. They were mm-hmm. in love with him. Uh, they just weren't in love with the experience of making the movie. But I think it's a highly enjoyable movie. A right. great John Williams score. I love and, it. Uh, right. it was a, and it was a big. It's interesting to note, and we'll know this coming up in other films. But it's interesting to note that some of the biggest hits of this summer were, you know, R-rated, adult-oriented films. I mean, Untouchables, Eastwick. Uh, Predator, No uh, Way Out, No Way Out, you know, Big Easy, and it is interesting that you know there was, there, you know, there was a time when you had your, you know, your PG, your PG thirteen, your R. It was this, as weird as it was, there still was a segregation going on, where as opposed to now, I mean, this summer, I mean, have we? Uh, I think we've had maybe what, I mean, Magic Mike and Ted are the 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 R rated mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. exceptions, and everything else is PG thirteen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's it, it, it's 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 weird. It's it's like sometimes even you can't quite tell the difference between an R and a PG thirteen now. Yeah, they all no, feel, you can. I, they, that's a good point. They all feel kind of homogenized. In some well, not only that, but even some of these films that are R, you know, that we're talking. I mean, I mean, it, it would be a hard, it would be a you know borderline case. But I mean, you could make a case that now Predator Predator could you know I could, I wouldn't be I don't think anyone would object if that was rated PG thirteen. You know, no, I, think you're right. I don't think so either. But I think that Witches of Eastwick is R-rated only for its occasional language. Yeah, I yeah. think in today's climate, you can get away with a very violent movie, or what we consider violent back then, being PG-13. But if you have yeah. like swearing and nudity, that's an R. Yeah, I mean that. This, yeah, this, know, was, this was 1987, and they said the word uh, "pussy." I mean, I, that's the first time know, I've ever said that word on the show. Right. Oh, I, re- I really hope release. that you guys. I really hope that you guys, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, get to see Killer Joe. I'm sure you are going to see it. Um, oh yeah. Because I, because that is because uh, that 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 is a movie that I just I just relished the pure depravity, mm-hmm. uh, the pure unapologetic depravity yeah. that was on screen, and uh, that is a, that is a movie that strikes me as you know as really like pushing pushing a lot of you know, I guess buttons or whatever you want to right. call it. You know, okay. it's just, or, you know, and 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 really, cro- it, it crosses the line, and I love that it crosses the line, and you can just feel the transgressiveness of it. Um, and I feel like it would probably be transgressive in any era, but in particularly now, I just really had a super fantastic time with it. Just uh, not I, just because of that, but feeling that kind of you know thrill of ah, at last, not a not a kind of pussyfooting R or PG thirteen movie. This, I mean, you know, it's rated NC seventeen. And you know, I mean, maybe in another era it could have been an R, but I mean, it just you really feel the the gut punch of it. And, well, I, I'm and, really and, looking forward to seeing it. I, I we actually just spent a, an hour, did an hour long interview with Friedkin, and uh, I mean, he's one of the guys that um, that that really has maintained that throughout his career. Like a, yeah. a pull no punches, not afraid to cross the boundaries. And, you know, and the and the resulting movies are. Are you sometimes know for worse, good or bad, you know? Better, but, yeah. but they're yeah. consistently kind of you know whatever you think of cruising that that was that really kind yeah, of no, I mean, towed into I, the I, line there. 
Yeah, I, I, I don't like cruising very much, but it does ex- have exactly that. I mean, he's very, he, he's unapologetic. And when the material suits that, when he gets like an exorcist or, you know, something like that, and he can have like a girl masturbating with a cross saying, mm-hmm. like, Jesus, fuck you. I mean, that, you know, you, <laughs> there's a scene in Killer Joe that we must talk about after you see it. And, well, and, also, yeah. I, well, and I'm going to stick up for Jade. Hello, Jade. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen Jade yet. Okay, so, wow. Have, okay, have, so have Aaron you, uh, is the one who's going to stick up for Jade. I was okay. uh, for Jade. Have you eaten you, fried chicken since that scene, Keith? Oh, you know, yes, you do. I, I have not, and I don't <laughs> think I ever will again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah I, so you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, anyway, so, uh, Lewinsky, I, hear. Uh, I, I, I have a great feeling for William Friedkin. I think he's a. It's an awesome a interview. I mean, a lot of insight there that I didn't know about. So that was yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and okay, so do we want to talk about Million Dollar Mystery or With Nail and I? Well, I, mean, I wish. Not, yeah. not Million Dollar Mystery. I mean, that was one of those great fiasco. Dino, God bless Dino De Laurentiis. I mean, I don't think any of us saw it thin. I mean, I know I didn't see it thin. Obviously, yeah. none of us won the million dollar contest, uh, so we don't need to, to talk about it. With Nail and I, obviously, a case, you know, then as in now, you know, one of those cases of small scale, you know, counter programming that got its own little, uh, its own little following. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, With Nail and I is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a classic. You know, you know, it's a, yeah, I wish I wish my friend Ali Arakan uh, was here because he's the hugest fan of With Nail and I mm-hmm. and. He could. He, I'm sure he could talk a blue streak about that one. Um, yeah. he, he wrote an essay, I think, for us, if I'm not mistaken, for the house on it. Um, it's it's a real personal favorite of his, and I haven't caught up with it yet. Um, yeah. It's Bruce Robinson, right? Yes, it, that is the reason that, uh, and it was because of that film that Johnny Depp seeked him out for a Rum Diary. Now, whatever right. whatever we may think or not think of Rum Diary, it is interesting that I mean that's the kind of impact, you know, those who saw with Neil and I, you know, it stays with them. So, um, mm. so. Mm. But anyway. Uh, that same day, June 19th, we have Fred Schapisi? Is it Schapisi? Yes. Fred, Fred Skepsi, I believe. Yeah. I always thought it was Skepsi, and then I, th- I thought Aaron told me it was Schapisi. So I didn't know which way to... Yeah, wait, wait, wait. He's, <laughs> he's now from Brooklyn, apparently. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I didn't I'm, know which I'm, way to address him, because I called I, him one I, time. I, I I am going to look up Fred Luzza and see, and I'm going to and I'm going to see if it says pronunciation, and we'll see. I, I would have called him on. up and I said, uh, Mister S C S H, you know, Rox uh, <laughs> Roxanne, Roxanne, mm. Cyrano de Bergiac, romantic comedy, Steve Martin, Daryl Hannah. What do we think? I love it. Mm-hmm. I actually think it's the best telling of the Cyrano story. Uh, I love it. Uh, I think it's a wonderful. I think it's a great. It's one of Martin's best uh, love. I guess it has a lightness mm-hmm. uh, that I guess I find it utterly uh, romantic. I, I I'm a big rock fan. Who's his friend? Who plays the other? The, the Rick the, Rostovich. Uh, good act. You know, unfortunately he didn't take off like I. You know, as a good. What did you know, Dean Siskel say about him? It's dumb as a sea slug. In the yeah. movie, it was great. It was one of the funniest things. This is dumb as a sea slug. But uh, lo- uh, I, I love all the I love the updating of it. I think mm-hmm. it's terrific, and I I actually think it's Daryl Hannah's best uh, perf- outside of L Driver. I think it's her best, <laughs> best work. I know it's a good it's a good movie. I'm and Press, here. don't forget Press. Oh yes. And Blade Runner and Splash. I mean, I I give her all those. Yeah. I mean, Memoirs uh, of an Invisible Man. I like Roxanne, and actually, and it, yeah, it, it, it marked it marked a a great uh, a turning point. Uh, maybe that's too strong a word, but in Steve Martin's career, that you saw him finally as that kind of romantic leading man without without parody. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, uh, all of me, he was terrific, in, and there were elements of that in there, but he was still doing his mm-hmm. his very wacky shtick, and this mm-hmm. felt well, this felt like a enough. real like a real kind of charming human being in Roxanne. This is long before Cheaper by the Dozen or burning down the house or bringing down yeah. the house or whatever it was. There's something that he capitalized on in Parenthood and yeah. you know, some some really strong right. performances. Right. Now, he's, he's, he's kind of like he's kind of like one of the few broad comics who I think does have as equal talent as a as a dramatic actor not to say everything he does in both in either 
you know, Vane is is good, but uh, when he is really good, he he, he can be he, he can be spectacular doing like really broad comedy, and he can be really great doing drama. But, like yeah. I actually think of like the Spanish Prisoner, the the mammoth mm-hmm. film in, in which he's really terrific. You know, that and, and leap of and faith. Uh, he's. I mean. He, I mean. Leap, leap of faith, faith is very good. He's very good yeah. in leap of faith. I mean, uh, his one scene in, in the band played on. He's terrific. Uh, right. And, yeah. and, and so I mean, yeah. Steve Martin and Grand Grand Canyon playing kind of this mm-hmm. Joel Silver like, you know, you know, smug producer. Uh, he's mm. uh, he's terrific in that. So yeah, no. So uh, I just threw that in there for, to annoy Jamie because he hates that movie. Uh, but uh, Roxanne. I think it's terrific. And another, and interestingly enough, a PG-13 kind of film, but a film about, you know, cast with adults and aimed towards adults, um, you know, and was a hit with adults. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You had more movies, as you guys pointed out. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I am looking at this. You had more <laughs> movies aimed at adults that were playing in wide release, that, unlike you do in the last decade. Where you don't, you have to go to a landmark or the art house or on demand. Really, you do not have a lot, or what is considered, how should I say, an adult, is middling at best. Um, it's very interesting um, comparing and going back and and looking at that. You're, we're bringing up movies that were very popular with adults, not just thirteen to twenty five year olds. Yeah. Well, and something like Roxanne would be placed in there today, as as counter programming mm-hmm. like uh, maybe we can convince people you know if that that movie sold out they can sneak in hours and maybe right we can succeed right, based right. on that yeah it would be that it would get that that one or two slot that every summer gets that that Julie and Julia that Julie and Julia kind yeah. of yeah 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 that would be I was thinking that was the movie I was actually thinking of too yeah. um but it is interesting how that how times ha- have actually changed Quite drastically in that regard. Somewhat, yeah. Um, Spaceballs came out the next week. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, we're talking about Spaceballs the movie, mm-hmm. not the book of cereal. It's that whole to monologue he does. Spaceballs the breakfast cereal. That was great. Yeah. That was yeah. They didn't have to change the flamethrower the kids watched. They didn't have to change the title for the porn film. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, they don't even have to change it. That's right. No, actually, they it, did that, change the title for it. They they called it Space Nuts, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why I've seen that, that too. Let me ask you guys that, a question. Yeah. Is this the last truly not funny Mel Brooks film? Last, like, truly nonstop, like, roller coaster? In terms of my experience, yes. Now, I would have God, to say, was, Life Stinks and even Robin Hood Men in Tights. I know some people like that one. Oh, I'm not crazy about that no, one. No, no, no. Dracula is just awful. But this is I mean, last. honestly, pro- probably Spaceballs isn't all that great either, but I, God, I love it. I love oh, it's everything. hilarious. It's got some great I love, ev- I love everything about it, and quite frankly, for me, it has surpassed Star Wars at this point. It is better <laughs> than Star Wars. Spaceballs is better than the entire Star Wars sextology. I will say that here right now. I would rather watch that over and over again than anything by Lucas uh, regarding the Star Wars. I think it's You're really... Uh, you're not you're not doing yourself any favors there, Keith, with uh, getting the comments. But go ahead. Uh, I, I I don't give a shit about this. That movie, Spaceballs, is a movie that I that I I I, I saw that so many times. It was on video cassette. It was the video cassette I rented the most. I had seen it about six or seven times, and I went to the video store to rent it like an eighth time or something like that. And someone had the cassette in their hands, the last cassette in the store to. To, to rent it, and I took it from them. I took oh it from God, them, and you like I a wanted bully to of see it myself. I was, obsessed, I was obsessed with that film. Yes, I bullied so I was like, give me that. I want that. I, that is my... Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I took it. I, and, will, and, I will put forth that it is, at the very least, the best Bill Pullman performance. Oh, he's uh, great. He, he, uh, he's great. Far from not here, mister. This is a Mercedes. I mean, no, and, and oh, oh, my God. We can connect with Killer Joe also, the, one of the best lines ever, which I never got until like several years later. What's the matter, Colonel Sanders? Chicken? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Amazing! God, how many plugs is Killer Joe getting tonight? The, you gotta love the, the, asshole, gotta love the... the asshole exchange is, is, is one of the... I, I've quoted that 
like I, I I could do that all from memory, and I'm not going to do it now because that will just it will take up too much time. But yeah, God, we're only yeah. in June right now. Come on. I, mean. I know we're only in June. I, we're going to be done by 1 a.m. I guess. Uh huh. I'll try so to wrap it up in, before that. But you, you got to love Pizza mm. the Hut. Gotta love yeah, Pizza. pizza the, oh, the Hut. Pizza the hut. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to, you know, the coffee maker, the the space balls, the movie on video cassette, and when is this happening now, sir? We're, we're now. Everything that's happening now is happening now. What happened to them? We passed them. When? Just now. We're at now now. I mean. <laughs> so Keith really likes this movie, obviously. Wow, this yeah, is I, a revealing episode. <laughs> yes, I, I make of it what you will. I, I adore Spaceballs with all my heart. I would not put it on my sight and sound top ten list uh, of all time, but it, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is one of. I mean, it is, it is a, it is a favorite film. I just, I, I adore everything it about is, it. It is a terrific, it is a terrific parody, uh, and I believe the story is. I mean, Lucas gave it the okay because of the tenth anniversary at the time of the tenth anniversary. It is interesting to note that Summer of 87 was the first summer without a Spielberg-directed or Lucas-produced uh, mm-hmm. film. Uh, so, you know, at the time, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I can only imagine that at the time there, there was this probably this inkling going on. Oh, Star Wars! That was a long time ago. You know, Star Wars. You know, Star Wars is so omnipresent now. But I'm sure back in '87 when Spaceballs came out. I, I, I mean, if you look at the Siskel and Ebert episode, they're like, this is kind of, you know, Star Wars is kind of past. You know, we don't, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of, you know, a little late. You know, obviously it's, uh, you know, obviously it's not late, you know. No, Star probably Wars space, has faded a lot probably space, by then. Probably Spaceballs plays even better now to it audiences does. than it did in 87. Mm-hmm. It does. I mean, it's, yeah, especially now with the new trilogy. I mean, yeah. because the new trilogy is so fucking like... Solemn and, and and dull and I mean in my opinion excuse me I'm not, no no I'm you're not, you're you're amongst good uh, company you just why are you bringing these uh, old wounds back man shit it's it, it's just like I mean it's just like spaceballs oh I I I'm the bearded lady who are you one of the freaks <laughs> like I can't stop you you I you have to stop me Jamie you have well, to I stop love, me and you're, I actually, no, it's good I, I like seeing the side of you I mean. I, I miss I miss the presence of Rick Moranis in in movies too because oh my I mean, god he, Rick Moranis he's is disappeared. So funny. I yeah. can't breathe in this thing. I can't breathe in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> what you went over my helmet? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, oh, the planet same, of the apes gag. Sorry. Okay, go on. That's say <laughs> that's say weekend. Baseball. Oh shit! There goes the planet. I do love the you gotta love the theme song too. That's a great theme song. I know. Oh god. Do That's you? Same weekend, yeah. guys. Do you? All right, you're married. Kiss her. <laughs> okay. No, Dragnet. No. That same weekend. Jamie, go. Dragnet. Oh. Fright Night? What? Dragnet. Drag- Dragnet. Yeah, I saw this in the Dragnet, theater. Fright Night. <laughs> Dragnet. Same thing. I remember, I remember naked people on it. Yeah. Oh, naked yeah, women? Yes. Because they, they sacrificed the virgin, right? Yeah, they, they sacrificed the virgin, virgin Connie Swales. And they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they actually, because this was PG-13, so they were still testing the boundaries of PG-13. So you could have brief, very brief nudity to PG-13, and so they go for the best coffee inside a strip club. Yeah. Uh, um, so I do, I do remember that. And what can we say? I mean, what do we want to say of anything? I mean, I'm a fan of Dragon. I actually like Dragon. I love, I love Dabney Coleman with his. Lips. Yeah, no, we're uh, we're in agreement there. Okay. Yeah, Christopher Plummer, the comic film. But what do we want to say at this point in history, in 1987? If you were, you know, a critic or whatever, aware of movies in his in, in, in 1987. Dan Aykroyd was a bigger star, and you're like, who's this Tom Hanks guy? I don't know if what's he, you know, you know. right. No, but at well, the Tom, time it was right for him, though it was that yeah. kind of role. That and actually, Dan, Dan Dan Aykroyd does the comedic version of what Kevin Costner does in The Untouchables. <laughs> uh, but uh, and Tom Hanks was like the highly enjoyable, smartass sidekick. Like, yeah. Uh, but mm. but Dan Aykroyd was this very. Very stoic, obviously, as Joe Friday presence that, but really anchored the movie and gave it gave it whatever heart it had too. Yeah. Um, uh, ironically, this is the first cover of Premiere magazine, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, it is. It was the first Premiere magazine cover of mm-hmm. Dan Aykroyd and uh, Tom Hanks. And uh, and what can we say about the the disco inflected hip hop theme song, City of Crime? 
Yeah, I, was, I still have that 45. Wow. Um, Tom, Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd. Day too. Something else came out that day, didn't it? Well, we're good. Yes. But yeah. uh, Keith, seen Dragnet yeah. or is that a blind spot? No, no, I've seen Dragnet. Uh, that was a video rental. And like I say, I, I remember most that there are these guys in white robes and they're sacrificing a virgin or something. And, you know, <laughs> and that's about all I remember from it. Anal Muzz. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like the Christopher Plummer when he does the sacrifice and he does that big speech. And, and I forget what it is. Like, uh, she's pure as snow from Oklahoma. Here we go. <laughs> what, 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 I like the scene in the men's room of the Brown Derby. Yeah, yeah. That was that, hilarious. Yeah, that, I like that, that well, movie. Yeah, I, like Tom, I like Tom Hanks' line reading. They're like, where are we going? Uh, it's off of Highway 61. Yeah. Yeah, and they they play well off one another, mm-hmm. right? and I think that's a good contrast between the two of them. That movie, also on that day, was a, is a movie that we're not talking about because we were covering a ad nauseum for Kubrick, and uh, and actually Keith, we've already talked to you ad nauseum about it, which is Full Metal Jacket. That was that weekend too. <laughs> yeah, yes, Dragnet and Full Metal Jacket. Oh my God! Okay, wow. And, and, my mom did overtime that weekend. You okay, kind of wonder I... which one was counter programming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, movie. the Full Metal Jacket is just, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's its really great. And mm-hmm. oh, yeah. I don't know if I'd put it in, in a top tier uh, of, Ku- of Kubrick's mm-hmm. just for my own personal taste, but, uh, I mean, it is... It's uh, the anti-predator. Both, and, 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 and both parts of it, you know, are, are very interesting. I think they complement yeah. each other in very interesting ways, and I'm not i am not someone who says the first part is better than the second. I, you got to have both, because I just think it, it's kind of like, once D'Onofrio goes out of the movie, you know, it becomes even more of a kind of dehumanize, dehumanizing experience, or examination of dehumanization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, because he, he, I think he's probably the one who feels deepest, and the one who feels deepest kills himself, and then it's like, you know, just the rest of the movie is like about the complete obliteration of any semblance of humanity right. whatsoever. And it's, you know, it just, it's, it's horrifying. It's, yeah. it's horrifying. It's horrifying in a way that um, you know that, that, that is very akin to like The Shining and and, and you know and Superman a, a lot of a lot of the other <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing that Kubrick you know in, it's just like amazing that Kubrick in '68 you know takes you beyond humanity and then when he gets back down in the muck of humanity you know what he shows you I just find is but know, it, 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 but it, is it as good as Benji the Hunted? I mean, that's the question. It's nothing as good as that. It's not as good as Spaceball, but, you know, what can be. Yeah. I just, I just like the idea of some moviegoer walking up to the box office in June of 87 saying, oh, gosh, what do I see, Spaceballs or Full Metal Jacket? Like, which one do I spend my money on? It's well, quite a, it's which quite one a do choice. I see first if I do a double bill? Do I, do yeah. I end on a happy note or do I end What am I in the mood for today? And, you know. yeah. uh, okay, July, 4th of July weekend. We have the combo of inner space and adventures in babysitting. Wow. Wow. I'm going to let Keith start off on that one. Good. What, um, you, you pick either one, Keith. Yeah. You know, I feel like inner space is not the best Joe Dante film. I remember Dennis Quaid's ass shot in that. <laughs> and funny that I, I, I would notice that at the time. But that's what I remember <laughs> most about inner space. Um, we all yeah. noticed that. Uh, it's just yeah, you know, for different I, reasons. Yeah, um, <laughs> I feel I feel like there are better Dante films, honestly, yeah. than Inner Space. I mean, you know, I, I guess there's some okay stuff and some okay comedy with Martin Short and mm. all, but you know, whatever. And I mean, Adventures in Babysitting. That's Chris Columbus's directorial debut, right? I believe so. I yes, and also, D'Onofrio, yeah. back to back D'Onofrios. So there you go. Yeah, I mean. You know, I guess Adventures in Babysitting is Adventures in Babysitting, but considering what Chris Columbus, you know, would eventually unleash on us poor, unsuspecting cinephiles, uh, I don't think I want to really recall well, anything about him fondly. So let a, me leave that to you. <laughs> I think that is a classic Adventures in Babysitting. You know, I, I, I label the summer as kind of the, you know, Hollywood, you know, making, you know, trying to copy previous successes. And I think Adventures in Babysitting is a classic example of, well, they like John Hughes movies. They like Ferris Bueller. Uh, let's, you know, let's do this summer's 
Ferris Bueller. Uh, I do think Elizabeth Hugh is very cute and very funny in that film. Uh, it's a, it's a, I remember as a kid, I, I, I always watched that film because, I mean, it's one of those fantasy films. You know, when you're a kid, you try to put yourself in that situation. So, I mean, I, I yeah. think it's a, I, I do think it has some charm. Uh, still, still has some charm to it. As for Inner Space, I guess the script is all over the place, but I mean, some of those special effects are pretty. Uh, yeah, impressive. I mean, all that you know, the stuff inside the body, the blood, the, the you know, all the, and the when the, when they shrink down to half their size and so everything, you know, they look. You know smaller. what's great about yeah, yeah. you know what's great about Dante? He when he works with effects, he doesn't he doesn't call attention to like the effort that goes into mm-hmm. them. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I, this is what I argue about like something like Gremlins Two, The New Batch, or, or Looney Tunes Back in Action, which are two of my favorites of his. Uh, you know, Lunington is back in action. The thing you remember about something like Roger Rabbit is that it's, you know, it, it, it you can sense the effort that went into, like, every frame. And Zemeckis doesn't let you forget it. And I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's just another approach to it. Dante just, like, he will he will toss things off. Like, it's just sort of like a gag that builds. These, all these gags that just build and build and build and mm-hmm. there's a momentum to it. And it's just like, you know, this, something that could have taken like hours or days to render or whatever will just pass by in the blink of an eye and 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 there's a, there's a beautiful artistry to that too a kind of unpretentiousness about that that's just like you know I, I we're like he has all these tools at his disposal but he's not going to you know uh he's he's not going to pull back the curtain sort of and say mm-hmm. look at what we did to make all this happen you know and that's right. what I love that's what and I love also, about we, we should point out in her space a pre collagen Meg Ryan back when her, yeah, exactly. her <laughs> lips um, were in proper proportion to the rest of her body. Yeah, I, I mean, but, but I, I, just even thinking back on inner space, I mean, I think there, there too, it's like what I love about Dante is his sensibility of, of, of not, um, of not, of not weighing, of not letting, of not letting the effects weigh down. Um, or calling your attention to the fact, yeah. wow, how did they do this and everything? You know, it's like he's he's very much someone who feels like I think you have to integrate, you know, you have to integrate <laughs> things together. It doesn't well, always work with him, but you know, I, I appreciate it when it does because it's a it's a really it's a really sensational experience when he, you know, uh, when, when 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 he's really firing on all cylinders. I think. Well, I remember I remember Inner Space being a lot of fun, and actually mm-hmm. the, the thought that comes to mind about Inner Space. It was one of the few times when Martin Short, who I really like, it's one of those. He's one of those comedians that so funny, like on talk shows and things. And then he's you genuinely respond well to him, or I do anyway. Mm-hmm. But he can't have he doesn't have any luck with film work. And this is one of the instances where I think he he did look into something that was worthwhile. Right. Uh, and I don't remember anything about Adventures in Babysitting, except I, I only saw it because I had a crush on Elizabeth Shue, and that, mm-hmm. that was enough to sustain me. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Revenge of the Nerds 2 the next week. Any thoughts on Revenge of the Nerds? One of the great, first of all, I'm not playing the song because we played the song years ago on the show. I don't want to repeat it. But uh, one of the great uh, pop songs associated with the movie. This is probably my favorite Kenny Loggins movie song ever for Revenge of the Nerds 2. Okay. Okay. That's all I have to say about it. I told, I told, and you know, that's why I love my man Jamie because he's willing, he's putting it on the record. Uh, Oh, yeah. I adore that song. Uh, Michael Keaton did the very forgettable uh, movie, The Squeeze, on July 10th. Another poster, I just remember, you know. (laughs) Yes, yes. The the, the hot chemistry between between Michael Keaton. The Twin Towers or something? Yeah. Um, Oh, God. Well, they, how would they know back then? I mean, that was a that was a portent of things to come. Uh, yeah, no, it's just one of those things that you know, it's like, oh God, you see some of these things now, and and you mm-hmm. look retroactively at it. It's weird, but you know. Yeah. Anyway. Because I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, and also let's not forget the unbelievable hot chemistry between Michael Keaton and Ray Dawn Cohn. Mm. Oh, was she the oh. one in that? Yes. Yeah, I remember there were a couple of movies around this period that were just like. Complete throwaways. There mm-hmm. was the, there was the squeeze. There was uh, catch and go. Maybe the Maria Cachito Alonso. Uh, yeah, I vaguely yeah. remember that. I actually like touch and go. Uh, All right, now we're starting. Oh God, here we go. Um, but, but, but but also, I mean, in this in this period of time was 
and I've always said it, was one of his great movies and one of his great roles, which is Clean and Sober. I mean, I, I, I love Clean yeah. and Sober. So. Yeah. Uh, and I love Michael Keaton. He's another guy that's massively missed uh, by me. Um, Ali Sheedy, the same day, headlined a movie made to order. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the next week came RoboCop, Verhoeven, Testosterone. <laughs> my my vote for best film of the summer and uh, the most the, the one true original film of that entire summer. Uh, a, a truly great film that we sh- that I need to point out that the uh, in in many ways great Ken Russell uh, called the greatest science fiction film since Metropolis. <laughs> so if Ken Russell says it, it no, must it's be true. a good yeah, uh, good and movie. It's just, it, uh, it 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 foretold a lot of things. It foretold. Uh, you know the audience's identification with machinery. Mm-hmm. You know before, you know mm-hmm. we had machines and special effects in movies, but they were usually seen through the prism, you know, through a human's perspective. Mm-hmm. Here is the first time where the actual robot was the perspective. You were the robot. I mean, so technology. Mm-hmm. You were gonna. We were identif- We were going to identify with the technology, and Verhoeven saw that. You know, he profoundly predicted that, and he mm-hmm. embraced it, cackling. Uh, I, when I rewatched it recently, when I wrote about it for press play, the, I was just stunned. I hadn't seen it in years, and I was just stunned at some of the things that are in it. The, the, uh, the fake commercials. My favorite being yeah. mm-hmm. for Kaboom. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. which, uh, where one kid says Pakistani is threatening my border, and I was yeah. just like, wow. Uh, yeah. It's uh, just Ronnie Cox, and I mean the fact. I mean a, a true '80s film, and that. The final showdown is not in the streets, but in a boardroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, no, and 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 that that is a movie uh, rare. And rare is the Hollywood movie. You find the Hollywood movie that does this. It ends on exactly the right beat. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like 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 when I like when I should break down the the Kurt Russell movie. I'm crazy about. That's a movie to me that like ends right when it needs to. Like, right, like, right. Like, at the moment, good that it shooting, needs to. son. And, you have a name. And, Murphy. Yeah, and it's just it just turns Murphy, yeah. and that's it. And it's like that's wow, perfect. That, that, the that's movie perfect. you know it, on the exterior, the movie looks like the the Bruckheimer, the senseless shoot 'em up Bruckheimer. But I I, I think it's I, so I much think, deeper than that. I don't no, think it this is. was the greatest satire. Uh, me, yeah, to finish my thought, I don't I don't think it was. Uh, I don't know if critics got when it first came out how smart it was, like how much it actually had yeah, on its mind. No, I you mean, know, I mean, in, you know, in in the fog of that moment, I'm sure they did. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, you're right. You know. I'm sure. I, I know critics who I know it mostly got good reviews, so they liked it because it was a superior piece of action filmmaking. And, and I know, I remember, I do know critics. Some critics did point, out, and I, they like, I like the little satirical bits he throws in there. But I, 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 I think you're right. I don't think they truly understood on how subversive Verhoeven was being. I mean, he really was bringing a European sensibility to action movies. He was moving the camera. Instead of editing on action, he was moving the camera to follow the action. So you had this mm-hmm. fluidity going on, and and that's what w- was making it kind of exciting. The action scenes weren't static. There was movement, but not in this born identity, right. Neville Dean Taylor movement, but there was this fluidity going on, and the violence was just as violent as any 80s action film, mm-hmm. but it had a Thing. Uh, I still maintain that the yeah. killing of Murphy, you know, we were talking about, you know, R rating and so forth. I am, you know, and of course, RoboCop did have some uh, some uh, ratings issue. They had to cut out like 47 seconds of it. The, the yeah. killing of Murphy is, to me, is still one of the most uh, horrific death scenes, I think, in movie history. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, no. it, it's extremely yeah. upsetting. Yeah, yeah they, they interviewed they interviewed Joel Kinnaman, who's the star of the reboot, and he actually, and this was something I was questioning. He actually said that their their reboot is is political minded. You know, it is. Yeah, well, it, we'll see. Well, it's we'll just see trying it's, it's trying to follow suit with that. So it's good that they they don't avoid well, that and, aspect. And, and no, the no, other no. thing that I that I love about the filming, and it is it is the greatest performance by Peter Peter Weller. Because I mean, this is the case where when he finally becomes a machine, Peter Weller as becomes a good actor. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those weird things that he's more human when he's mostly uh, machinery. 
uh, and I'm, I don't say that's kind of a knock on Peter Weller. I could say I could find that, that dichotomy, that, that that paradox, if you will. I find that endlessly fascinating. And this is, you know, this is, you know, one of the this part of that great Verhoeven uh, techno kind of. I, I call it his fear of cackling fear of technology trilogy between it, RoboCop, uh, Total Recall, and uh, Starship Trooper. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. These are kind of his his great films. I always thought it was just, I didn't watch it until it came out on videotape and I watched it many times but I watched it with my dad and my dad loved it and he got the satire and everything and he really couldn't stop laughing during parts of it and this is a man who you will relate to this Keith he hated the first Batman movie if we saw that in a the theater I think we would have had to leave he hated that movie He we watched it on videotape and he I have never heard him talk about a movie with such hatred as the first the Tim Burton Batman movie he just Really, I don't know what it was, but he hated hmm. that for me. But um, yeah, you know, I, I, it's weird because I kind of wonder what I'd think of like the Tim Burton Batman movie if I saw it like at the age I am now. Right. You know. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's weird. I mean, that's probably a whole other discussion. Yeah, that's a whole other. But, but he loved yeah. RoboCop, and that was a big well, shock because I didn't think uh, he for, would. For anybody that uh, is interested in RoboCop talk. Uh, a few years ago, we did our Peter Weller interview for Buckaroo Banzai, and we we covered RoboCop <laughs> as well, so you can go back through our archives for that. Uh, my cocaine <laughs> was uh, was in the great flop, the great uh, outside of Ishtar, the great folly that summer, <clears throat> and uh, his shooting of this film uh, prevented him from actually picking up his Oscar for Hannah and Her Sisters, and that was Jaws 4, The Revenge. Mm-hmm. Or which, which is, if I'm not mistaken, the the title is without a colon, right? So it's just Jaws: The Revenge. Yeah. Like the shark. The shark. Yeah. The revenge. Right. 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 <laughs> we were supposed <laughs> to go see this, and I read the novelization. I couldn't sleep, so I read the movie novelization. I told my mom, "We don't have to go see it. <laughs> we don't have to go see this. Let's go see Dragnet again. Um, let's, we don't have to see this." I actually did see it in uh, theaters. But, but I will say two. The two things I will say: one. Michael Caine, he deserved an Oscar for Jaws, The Revenge, because he so maintains his dignity as Odin. In a matter of speaking, yeah. Uh, in that <laughs> film, it's just, it's kind of, it's awe-inspiring. If you, if you, any actor should be, you know, just jaw-dropped, you know, if they see Michael Caine in Jaws, The Revenge, because he maintains his professionalism. And I... Love. If I ever meet him, this is what I'm going to ask him, and he's probably going to walk away. I'm going to ask Mario Van Peebles about his portrayal of uh, of uh, uh, the Jamaican uh, oh, God, yeah. oceanographer. Oh Angel. God! Yeah. He Supposedly, uh, he improvised uh, all of his line and dialogue, and if he did, he is also a consummate. Uh, Professional, and we should say this movie was not made in a vacuum. It was directed by, I believe, John Sargent, who Joseph talk about, Sargent. G- g- talk about falling on hard times because this man had made the original Pelham One Two Three, mm-hmm. and now he was making Jaws: The Revenge. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I have a soft spot for Jaws: The Revenge because it's so awful in in every way, and and you know there are two endings. To it, one where Mario Van Peebles dies, and another where he survives and he floats to the surface. He's like, "Hey, man, I'm okay." You know? <laughs> I tell, I tell you, he, I tell you, he don't like dark meat. I tell you, he don't like the dark meat. Yeah, it, it's just, I know, and it's just like there's one thing where like the shark gets poked by by the ship and he explodes if a bomb hit him, and then but we don't even we act- don't even see the shot of the shark actually being impaled. Well. It depends on which cut you watch. There yeah. is there, and I believe maybe the one on DVD has the, well, this needs the, to be the shot with the shark being impaled. This um, needs to be reissued with a branching, the, the seamless branching option yes. on the Blu-ray, so we can see yes. both and, and, and as and as Ebert pointed out in his review, Michael Caine, like his plane sinks, and then he swims to the boat, and he gets in the boat, and his shirt isn't even wet. I mean, yeah. that's the the level of you know craft in Jaws: The Revenge. Uh, <laughs> I I mean, but but still, it's just like yeah, it's I, great. I, it's it's great that the best thing you could say about the movie is that all the actors are professional. Like they should revolt. Like being <laughs> well, I mean. I mean 
you know, he's trying to make Lorraine Gary into an action hero. It's just like no. Well, you <laughs> yeah, say I mean, you, you say that, Jamie, but I mean, I mean, look at some of those Marlon Brando performances. I mean, he uh, he's uh, you know he's not being. I mean, he's he's certainly not professional in Christopher Columbus or Discovery. I mean, so I mean, uh, and neither is Tom Selleck for that matter. But I mean, so uh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Right? Now, actually, um, guys, just on uh, jo- just just because we've finished with Jaws: The Revenge, I should um, probably say that I might have to head out because I've got jury duty tomorrow. Oh, okay. And, okay. And I have to get up early. Um, okay. And I wish I could stay longer, um, but uh, mm-hmm. I think I better get to sleep. And- well, okay, well, buddy. I mean, these are always really long shows. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. I should ask you this, Keith. What, other yeah. than other than Full Metal Jacket, what is your choice as the best film from this summer yeah i, I mean the the because because I, I i love to laugh and i feel like i need to laugh today of all days uh space balls i'll go with um because uh that movie has provided me endless pleasure but th- but that's that uh, that's not even on the level of craft that's just like you know there are some movies like that you know i guess ultimately are not like the masterpieces of of the art that you love but they just they just they just make you consistently happy and you watch them and they're like you know a great comfort to you and and mm-hmm. they kind of they kind of build your spirit back up and you know i mean mel brooks has gone to some terrible places uh, <laughs> post space balls um, I mean, fortunately, you know, he, he redeemed himself somewhat when he had his arc on Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know, basically recycling his, he played a character who was recycling his old shtick for a malevolent purpose, and that's what was so funny about mm-hmm. it. So he still kind of had, he still kind of had that, but, you know, I feel like Spaceballs was really like the final one for me because I, I really did like all the earlier Mel Brooks mm-hmm. stuff I had seen, and, and this one was just the one that, it sticks with me too now, even because, like I said, I, I feel like it uh, it kind of has surpassed the Star Wars movies for me because the Star Wars movies have been kind of tainted by what you know Lucas has done to them and, and kind of destroyed them. He destroyed um, his greatest creation. Yeah, I mean it's it, it's unfortunate because you know um, it and and you can just sort of see now the problems that I think were just inherently in the original trilogy, even without the, you know, the special effects additions that we, that I think we just kind of gave a pass to because there was so much that was revolutionary mm-hmm. about it. But then he just, you know, he made it, unfortunately, I just think made it ordinary. Um, and uh, That's the you know, most when, intelligent thing yeah. I've ever heard anyone say about it. That, and, you hit it right on the head. Yeah, he it's, made it's, it ordinary. He made, he made he made it completely ordinary and and that's you know and I just feel like you know I remember when Spaceballs came out I think it was like Ebert wrote a review like why did Mel Brooks feel the need to make this you know for the 10th anniversary of, of Star Wars or something you know because Star Wars was still kind of highly thought of at the time and I just feel like in all honesty Spaceballs has surpassed Star Wars for me you know I mean that movie gives me untold pleasure. And, uh, you know, it couldn't exist without Star Wars. So it's kind of like, you know, it, it is kind of like, in some ways, I guess, uh, a, a parasite on it. But, you know, what it gives as a result of that, especially for someone who grew up, you know, uh, loving Star Wars and saw kind of ultimately what was uh, done to it and what was revealed by a lot of Lucas's kind of cravenness mm-hmm. uh, is um, it, it just... That that movie gives me untold pleasure. You know, it, it's like to laugh to, to find a movie that makes you laugh as hard as anything is is a re, is a real special thing. is a, is a treat, and, well, and that movie does that to me. And it, of course, comedy is subjective and everything, but that's the movie that like you know makes me laugh probably harder than almost anything. So I'm looking forward to seeing it again because they're going to reissue it. 25th anniversary Blu-ray oh, cool. edition. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to buying that. Keith, thank you so much, thank buddy, you. Thank for, you, for yeah. joining us again. I'm, I'm really sorry I can't stay longer, guys. I'm no, really that's sorry, fine. That's but... fine. We're about to close up anyway. Happy, yeah. happy, uh, happy belated birthday, Keith. Yeah, happy belated oh, thank birthday. Thank you very much. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Uh, I'll, we'll talk soon, okay? Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, buddy. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go on a limb. I mean, he didn't confirm or deny it, but I'm going to go on a limb and say Keith didn't like The Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, Summer I'm, school. 
came out July 22nd. Mark Harmon, uh, Carl Reiner film. Directed. Yeah. Yeah. Kirstie Alley when she I was thin and pretty. When I saw it, I liked it. I won't lie. I liked it too, but it, it was originally supposed to be based on an interview we did for the series that was erased. So we, my fault. Uh, it was originally supposed to be an Amy Heckerling uh, movie. Oh wow! Uh, and it had a different slant. I mean, it was more kind of acerbic and biting. And then they brought in Carl Reiner, who was definitely from a different generation. Yeah, that would and make it, sense. Yeah. It changed character in a way. So we never really know what summer school might have been. We can imagine it. But it was probably would have been a much different movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, and apparently the role of Chainsaw was really sought after, the one that Dean Cameron right. eventually played. Like His it was minus hour. Yeah, I do um, like the fact. Uh, I'll just say this: this is interesting present day factoid that the website, the revered horror T-shirt website, FrightRag dot com, is they put out these. You know, they put out. You know, that's where I got your Shining shirt, uh, Jamie. Uh, that one of their current shirts right now is a Chainsaw and Dave T-shirt. Uh, yeah, so that goes to show you how cool well. And that's, wow. that's, I mean, as a huge, I mean, and this was when I was young too, and <laughs> and the, the impact that Chainsaw has on me now. I mean, it was especially so then, mm-hmm. a few years after I'd just seen it for the first time. Uh, I. That summer school was very special to me just because they paid honor to to the power of the original Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, I like that about it. <laughs> and I like Mark Harmon. I mean, I thought I, I actually liked Mark Harmon as a presence. I even liked Stealing Home. With yeah, Mark yeah, no, no, he was good. I like. I have no beef with summer school. I thought it was very funny when I saw. And he really did get it. That's another life. film career that didn't take off, Mark yeah. Harmon. But you know, his TV career, he's got the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, on July 24th. Uh, Superman <clears throat> faces off against Nuclear Man. What I love about partially about this is their their noble intentions, or at least Christopher Reeve speaks of his noble intentions, mm-hmm. uh, in terms of really speaking to nuclear disarmament and all of that kind of stuff, and world peace and... Uh, uh, the material absolutely did not do that justice. <laughs> no. no, I I had interviewed the one of the screenwriters of this, and he, he said this was literally a case of at the eleventh hour. I can't remember the percentage, but basically a chunk of the budget got taken away. Yeah. Uh, so some of stuff that was in the script that was kind of funny and irreverent, they couldn't shoot it. And he said, you know, and I go so. Do you know when you're making this that uh, you know, you know, this isn't good? He's like, you try to see if you can salvage it. You know that it's not what you intended, but you try to see because movies, you know, you never know with movies. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. you can't pull it up, so you try to see, but you kind of know. You know, he says the moment I saw the, uh, I, I know this from the commentary. He says the moment I saw the opening credits, I knew it wasn't it because. The opening credits were totally different from the previous Superman opening credits, and it looked, you know, totally different and not in a in a good way. And it just, uh, yeah, it really it, does it, look like a discount Superman. Um, yeah, and it, it doesn't even Superman. have any kind of juicy element that the the third one had, where you know Superman turns evil and kind of faces himself. Right? Mm-hmm. Doesn't have that, and and even you know, and you can feel that they're trying to like, okay. Okay, what works and what does well? Well, bring back Lex Luthor, so that'll maybe that'll get some the, the old fans interested. Hey, they bring back Lex Luthor. They're like, but oh, we also got to get the kids. Okay, so we'll get John Cryer, pretty in pink, right? Play Lex Luthor's nephew. It's like, okay, you know, so you get they're putting you can feel it kind of they're putting pieces together that aren't uh, aren't fitting, and it's just you know, it's just pretty uh, it's pretty bad. Uh, La Bamba came out that same day as oh, Superman: yeah. Quest for Peace. I'm sure. I'm sure. Even though I'm sure, I know the studio thought Superman was going to flop. I'm sure they thought, well, we're going to do better than La Bamba at the very least. And no. you know, La Bamba goes off and becomes not only a, a you know big time sleeper hit, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the song reentered. I think it peaked. I, I can't remember if the song went to number yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so here's a case of a of a of a 
20, you know, a 28-year-old song reentering the charts and being number being number one again, you know. And I my main my thing is that it, this was part of a new the boomers were now truly running Hollywood. So oldies, you know, nostalgia for their oldies was really uh, had started in earnest with uh, Stand By Me the previous summer, another case of another song, you know, another song hitting the top three mm-hmm. and number, or going number one. So they're like, well, what else? And so you're, you're, you know, you're repackaging oldies from their youth, but also packaging them for the youth market. And But the thing is, La Bamba is a really nice, small story. It's, it's a good double bill, obviously, with the Buddy Holly story. Mm-hmm. And a great yeah. East Time. And, and funny, Lou Diamond Phillips is good. He's sturdy, uh, but you know he's kind of bland. Uh, but the best performance is East Time Morales. Yeah, I think ah, everyone East recognized Morales, that when yeah. it came out too. Yeah, that he was the high point of it. Um, on the same day, July thirty first, uh, Schumacher's The Lost Boys, mm. Mm. Uh, which, uh, in contrast to Twilight, I mean, it seemed very superficial at the time and and glossy and. But then you look at Twilight, and uh, Twilight makes the Lost Boys vampires look like total badasses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> true, <laughs> true, very true. Uh, yeah. But that, uh, that same day, The Living Daylights, the uh, the Timothy Dalton Bond, his only go at the role, right? No, it was two. First, first of two. Oh, he first did two. First of two, then his well, license kill. But oh, I, right, right. this movie holds up very well for a James Bond movie. I actually think this is a very good movie. It, and it's not one, I mean, I liked it the first time, and then I sort of fell out of favor, but the last decade or so, I actually when there's not, when it's when there are no commercials or the least number of commercials when it's shown, but um it's I like this one a lot. It's really for me gained in stature. It's like got everything going for it. Um, the globe trotting, all that kind of thing. Um, Who's the Bond girl in this one? Uh, Olivia Diablo. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I watched it again last week actually because it's, a, it's Encore, a lot of fun. It's a lot Encore of fun. did their tri- marathon. Mm-hmm. And this is one of them that I checked out and. Uh, I like Dalton as Bond. Yeah, uh, he, it's yeah. a sturdy he didn't get Bond. Fair dance after and License to Kill Bond. He didn't get really a fair. This yeah. is Aha does the theme song. I, I guess the most, I guess the thing that everyone, I, remember, I, I, I didn't see it in the theater. I do remember everyone talking at the time. Uh, everyone making a big deal about this being a safe sex Bond. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think I don't even think he has sex in the film. I think he just makes out with a girl or. He makes out with a girl, um, I think, at the end or something. But it was it was a good, it was a solid movie. I mean, remember after License to Kill Bomb, they wanted to, um, he wanted to he wanted to sell the rights. You know, he wanted to get rid of. No one would buy them from him. Everyone was like, "You're nuts." Mm. Yeah. August fifth, Stakeout, John Badham. You know, and I think this is the, I mean, Badham kind of owned every summer that we've talked about in the yeah. series. He came out with hit after hit after hit. And this was the end of the run, I think, uh, with yeah. Stakeout in I'll terms of you, that. I'll ask you this, Jamie. You know, if I'm not mistaken, I think Stakeout is like the number two grossing film of that summer. Uh, it's like, I mean, it's like over $80 million that summer. And why do you, I mean, what's your theory of why do you think this cop buddy film, I mean, because it's a cop buddy film, why do you think this one like people, you know, it hit and people went to, as opposed to because it worked. I mean, because I I, I rewatched Stakeout recently, and uh, it's genuinely funny, and mm-hmm. I think everything that works about it works because of the chemistry between the two of them. I mean, they click. I, I think that that was a great partnership, uh, and it was something that Batam as a director really fed. Mm-hmm. During the shooting of it, I mean, they had a relationship that was very comical and practical, jokey, Emilio Estevez and Dreyfus uh, off the set, so and that translated onto the screen too. I had a general sense of fun and a re-emergence, rediscovery of how good Richard Dreyfus can be. Yeah, you know, he, uh, yeah, he was riding high because uh, the previous year was down on Beverly Hills, and I think Tin Man, while it wasn't mm-hmm. a big hit, Tin Man had was gotten some critical buzz and mm-hmm. back in. March of '87. I mean, so this was all part of that Dreyfus uh, comeback. What, what I will say that one thing I do like about the film. I mean, I, I do like the film quite a bit. Is that you know, and it's funny how just one little change will make a difference. Is that here is a cop buddy film, but not in L.A., New York, or Chicago. I mean, it was yeah. in Seattle, and so it was, it was a very wet, rainy, gray-looking film. And so just you know, just that one change in milieu just gives it this kind of 
maybe extra grittiness that it wouldn't have had in if it was just a regular other big city. And also a very good uh very good strong villain, Aiden Quinn is actually quite menacing mm-hmm. in the film. And uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, I guess find I guess find it interesting that this is you know it's one of those it's a cop buddy formula film that they were getting a lot of. I mean, I mean, Lethal Weapon is only like I think what uh, four months old, uh, you know, when this movie comes out, and yet you know it really I mean it really clicks. Yeah. I personally prefer Running Scared, but I mean I, I think they're both good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know. Yeah, I mean, it all has to do with the chemistry of the two leads, and it, it, it was there in this one. It was a fun movie. Um, back to the Beach. Well, Annette Funicello, and, right? And, and yes, Frank, and, and Frank and, Avalon, Frank, yeah. I actually like Back to the Beach. I think it's, a, I mean, it's one of those films, I, I'm sure the studio thought they were going to, you know, they were going to have a, I don't know, actually, I don't know what they thought. Uh, but the more you know about your kind of arcane film history, uh, the more fun Back to the Beach really is, and you, you, if you, if you know what it's spoofing and sending up, but with affection, Back to the Beach is a lot of fun, and it has a great, out of nowhere Pee Wee Herman performance. Uh, he comes on, does Surfing Bird, and it's just hilarious, and it, it makes no sense, but it's just hilarious. And Connie Stevens is terrific, and I, I, yeah. I, I did like Back to the Beach. It was it was that summer's uh, the exotic Marigold Hotel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was that summer's Midnight in Paris. <laughs> uh, Masters of the Universe. That's the He-Man thing. Canon yeah. came out oh, with the yeah, Masters that's of right. the Universe. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, Dolph, Dolph Lundgren, Lundgren as He-Man. Yeah. That was Frank Langella as uh, Skeletor, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Skele- I mean Franklin. I mean that's one of the things. Frank Langella was born to play. He was born to play Skeletor and Nixon. So he's played the two roles he was born to play. And you would think Same character. Lund- you'd think Lundgren was was born to play He Man, but uh he just uh doesn't uh, just doesn't uh, translate. This was obviously his first starring film where he headlined after uh uh Rocky Four. And so just I know yeah, I, I, I have I, affection for it. I it's just I, I watched it again. Recently, it was on cable, and I watched part of it again. Courtney Cox, like early Courtney Cox, was in that too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who's that girl? Uh, Madonna Griffin Dunn. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've never. Honestly, I've never. I think I've seen maybe two minutes of it. I've never seen it. I I always liked the the song. I did like that album, but uh, I've never seen it. It's not great, uh, obviously. Uh, and that same day, Nadine came out. If you guys remember, mm-hmm. Kim Basinger and Jeff Bridges. Yeah, their first pairing uh, before uh, Robert Bitten. Robert Bitten. Robert Bitten. Right? Yes. That, yeah. And uh, I believe filmed in Austin. And uh, I saw this as a kid. And, you know, obviously back in eighty-seven, eighty-eight. I don't remember much. I mean, I assume. I assume if I saw it today, I'd probably. I assume I'd at least find it charming, just because. I mean, usually Jeff Bridges will will give you an interesting uh, performance. It is interesting to note that this is uh, '87, and then I think 17 years later they do uh, Door on the Floor together. So mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. a really good movie. I love yeah. that movie. But I, I, you know, I don't remember Nady. I, I do. If I'm not mistaken, I think they do use the uh, the Chuck Berry song in the movie. Uh, I don't remember. I, I remember. don't remember it at all. I'll be honest. Yeah, I'm sure they do. It was a it was a failed movie. I mean, the movie didn't work. Uh, it just didn't. It and I'm not talking box office, but it didn't work box office. But it, it didn't. It wasn't uh, great. Um, I think everyone involved in it kind of felt there was a missed opportunity. Can't buy me love. Once again, was, another one of these, you know, kind of a John Hughes clone crossed with this kind of. New new resurgence of eighty of fifties you know of oldies music mm-hmm. up you know resurgence nostalgia you know you know and, and, uh, you know it's you know everyone talks about how you know everyone always there's always a story written up whenever a, a Beatles song is now used in a in a movie or in a TV show you know Mad Men used a Beatles song and so everyone there was a lot of write up on that right obviously in eighty seven I, I assume this is when Michael Jackson owned the catalog. So uh, you could get a Beatles song probably at a, I mean, while not at a cheap rate, I mean, he was willing to license it. 
more freely uh, than I guess the actual Beatles are now. Because I mean, not only was this film named after Beatles song, it actually uses the Beatles song for the closing credits. Uh, I, I, obviously, uh, interesting enough, if you listen to the lyrics of the song, I don't think it really relates to the movie, which is basically a teenage version of Pretty Woman, except she's not walking the streets, but she's still no. a prostitute. So this movie uh, has a following, though. This movie has a cult following. Well, Dempsey, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. even before, like, you know, it's always had, like... And it was remade, though, so in um, was in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I forget the... Uh, I forget the... I forget the, the name, too, but it was remade. Um, yeah, but, I mean, uh, I mean, it's it's a harmless film. You know, we're talking about summer school. I, You know, these are kind of harmless films. If I had to rank some of these, these, these teenage kind of comedies, I'd probably... Uh, Babysitting, Summer School, Can't Find Me Love. And I would say Babysitting and Summer School are probably a tie. Looking at this cast, Dennis Dugan, mm-hmm. Steph Green. Yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. The original title of it was Boy Rents Girl. And I guess Mac that Perlick, didn't test. Amy Dolenz, I mean, everyone is like sort of, mm-hmm. yeah, wow. I assume that, that title didn't test well because it sounds a little uh Yeah, <laughs> distasteful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh Okay, No Way Out came out on that day, too. Uh, another Costner, Costner double hitter that mm-hmm. summer. This was his coming out, if you will, as an actor, as a star. Not I like I like that he's coming out. As a star, as a star. Uh, this, uh, and this is the Costner performance I like, as opposed to The Untouchables. This is, what he, this is where it suits his squareness, suits the role. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just think and a rare, you know... And, you know, this is actually a decent Sean Young performance. Uh, the limo scene. The, the limo scene. Cause although, there's no way out. I'm not. I'm actually not. I, I mean, I mean, I love. I mean, it's a, it's a fun scene, but I don't think it's. I don't think it's as height. I don't think it's as good as it's height. Uh, no, but, but the first I time do, you see it, oh, you know, it's like wow. I do love the. Uh, the I mean, and it has a great foot chase. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the great foot chases. Yeah, and a surprising twist. Yeah, and, the twi- uh, it is a great twist. It's and actually, twist. The, the the element of the film that got the most praise when it came out was Will Patton mm-hmm. as the psychotic kind of assistant of Gene Hackman in the mm-hmm. movie. Uh, Roger Donaldson coming yeah, off of the bounty. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Disorderlies also came out that day. Uh, <laughs> I've actually seen Disorderlies, by the way, people. I have seen Disorderlies. Yeah. August 21st, uh, a double hitter here, <clears throat> uh, The Big Easy. Mm, yeah. Mc, Mc, uh, Jim McTeague? Bri- Jim, Jim McBride. McBride. McBride, yeah. See, and this is, to me, this is it, this has far the far better sex scene. This uh, is a great movie. Mm-hmm. This is like everyone's <laughs> really top notch in this movie. I mean... And this is... 87, I mean, Dennis Quaid was known, obviously, by this time, but this was kind of his, uh, his really his big year. Mm-hmm. Interspace, Big Easy, and um, Suspect. That's right, Suspect. Or at, the, at the end of the year. So, uh, Big Easy, kind of, uh, I remember the New York Times review, I believe, Vincent Canby said, you know, uh, Dennis Quaid exhibits kind of the... Uh, the rascal, kind of the charm of a young mm-hmm. Jack Nicholson, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a uh, it's and great Alan Barkin. It's it's John one Gilbert. of her best roles, I think, actually. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, no, love Big Easy. Mm-hmm. I do love yep. how they kind of. I do love how um, I think it was an episode in the first season of Treme. Uh, John Goodman mocks the Big Easy, um, uh, particularly. There's a love hate uh, thing of, of New Orleans has of the Big Easy. They love the film. But they do groan at some of the overly uh, pronounced accents and mannerisms in the film. So I yeah. do love the fact that John Goodman kind of mocks it, even though he's in the Big Easy. But it is a good movie that makes good use of itself. Yeah, I mm-hmm. mean, it's um, Dirty Dancing was the other big movie mm-hmm. that came out. That I mean, that's talk about a movie that's became iconic from the right. summer. That's that's the one. And uh, I actually, I just recently rewatched it. Uh, like last month for the first time in, I don't know, decades. And um, uh, it works. Uh, yeah, no, it, it does. Works. Uh, it goes against a pet peeve of mine, a rule that I have of, I don't like movies set in the past. You know, 
part- and they're music intensive, and they have uh, new music to try to be period music. I don't like the mixing of that. But uh, the songs, a couple of these songs, the new songs do kind of work within the uh, the story. Um, but no, this is a. I mean, Dirty Dancing is is a good is a good movie. Mm. Um. Well, outside of that, uh, we have uh, we have other movies, but probably not worth discussing. But right. Hamburger Hamburger Hill. Came out on August twenty eighth, and That's I, a good I, movie. I, I recall there being such an uproar about the the level of violence in that mm-hmm. movie. Mm-hmm. But it was well. I thought it was a well made movie. I mean, who did that? Who did that? Don movie? Irving, I think. Did that. Yes. Yeah. I actually saw this in theaters. My dad, you know, my dad was in Vietnam, so we went to all the Vietnam. So I mean, uh, I remember going as a kid seeing Platoon, and I remember going as a kid seeing Hamburger Hill. Um, I fell asleep during Hamburger Hill, um, just because it just well, I, and I didn't fall asleep again during Full Metal Jacket. So I guess I could tell you how one was able to capture a nine-year-old or eight-year eight going on nine-year-old, uh, you know, imagination, fancy, while one I fell asleep mm-hmm. during. So my dad went because he remembers he, he the title alone. He's like I knew. He's like I know Hamburger Hill. I know what that that is. So I think right there that piqued his interest. Um, I don't think he's seen it since. It, obviously, it's not a, it's not one of the Vietnam films that resonates. It's kind of on par, probably a little better than Platoon Leader, but probably not by much. Um, Finally, uh, John Sayles, Mate One, right? Mm-hmm. Mate One, great movie. Yeah. yeah. Great, great American movie that nobody, no, nobody's really seen about unions. Uh, with an early uh, Chris Cooper performance, right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and James Earl Jones is in there also. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, so uh, I guess it's like I said, you know, summer '87, kind of a stay the course summer. A lot of doubles and triples. Not really one of the, not really a game changing blockbuster at all. Well, yeah, that that's why we just spent two hours and. We just spent the length of the Dark Knight Rises talking about it. <laughs> so do we want to? Uh, so do we want to pick our favorite film of that summer? Maybe not. Well, huh. I mean, I would have to say that the greatest film of the summer is Full Metal Jacket, mm-hmm. but. And that's not even a film that I necessarily love. I mean, first of all, it's not a film that I love. Right. It's the it's the one Kubrick that I can't completely get on board with. But I think it's undeniable amongst this crop of movies right. in these three months that it's the greatest, and it's probably the one that's had the most enduring influence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, well, I guess so. What would be number two? The non, cause, I mean, I mean, I would pick Full Metal Jacket also, but I mean, because obviously it comes out during the summer. But I kind of think Full Metal Jacket is kind of one of those things that it exists even beyond yeah. the summer. Oh, right. right. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and, and most great movies do exist beyond their season, but uh, right. in the, which they release. I mean, outside of that, I think that probably the second best movie would be RoboCop. Uh, yeah, RoboCop. I'd have to pick. Actually, I would have to really pick that one. Predator is really strong, mm-hmm. and, and in terms of pure enjoyment, probably Predator and, and which is V-Switch. Those, these are all ones, yeah. And they, I have to put the Untouchables on there. I, I like the Untouchables and the Living Daylights too. I would put them on. Yeah. Well. And Dragon, I would, even. I would, put I would say I mean, the ones that you know, if I was a critic and I was giving out four stars, I mean, outside of Full Metal Jacket, I would say my favorite would be probably I would probably be uh, uh, RoboCop. Uh, Big Easy, and then Roxanne. Mm-hmm. Uh, those mm-hmm. like a lot movies. of good, fun movies that summer. I mean, those would be you know those those are films that I mean if I was actually like making a a top ten list of the you know best of that year, I mean those three RoboCop, Big Easy, and Roxanne. At this point, I mean I'd have to sit down and do it. Uh, I can't imagine them at least two out of those three not making my top ten. So I mean. So how often do you get where movies released in the summer are going to be 
a good chunk of your top ten. Uh, so, and then you know, Predator and Untouchables are, you know, whatever their flaws are, they are fun diversion. And same thing with Dragnet. And like I said, I I stick up for uh, Dirty Dancing and, and Lost Boys. Mm-hmm. That's some good. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of this, stuff that defines my high school years here. I mean. I yeah. think the best thing about Lost Boys is actually Kiefer Sutherland's performance. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a really good, solid uh, villain performance. No, let's not forget Jason Patrick was. Um... Uh, I mean, Jason Patrick's good. I mean, but he's kind of the straight man in that it kind of. It, he's just kind of not. He's not a full participant. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. But... 